It's April 25th, 2022. This is Rook. Get ready for a crash course on the metaverse. What are those cryptocurrencies and NFTs that are all the rage? And what are the implications for Iranians around the world? Making the case for crypto is political analyst Maysam Behrabesh joining us from Sweden to explain why he believes digital currencies will be the future and why you should get in on them now. And making the case for NFTs is lawyer and international business advisor Awin Tabakoli in Zurich. What is the real value of those little digital images and are they the smart way forward or the latest version of the dot-com bust we will discuss plus we have your letters of the week i'm gian gomeshi this is rook there welcome to episode 176 of rook hope you're keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world hello to you from toronto canada salam dustana aziz durud bashama the metaverse kian the metaverse, the metaverse. <laughs> this is uh, i mean if, if you're listening if you're out there listening go oh the metaverse i don't really know what this is what they're going to be talking about uh that's okay because this is going to be a primer i'm going to ask some elemental questions but I'm going to try and navigate this for those who do know uh, all things cryptocurrency and NFT so that um, it'll be an interesting conversation for them too. But Maysam Behravesh joining us from Sweden, Awin Tabakoli joining us from Switzerland uh, about cryptocurrencies, about the metaverse, about NFTs. Uh, and basically the question, the subtext of it will be, for me, will be, uh, should you hold off is it is it wise to hold off? Let this play out a little bit before you you throw yourself in there, invest, jump in with two feet, or is that short sighted, conservative, and will you be missing out? Are you the person who didn't invest in oh. the Apple stock in 1992 or whatever? You know, which which so, one which one of those characters are you, Gian John? Mm. Like, are you uh, the FOMO guy who's like, no, I gotta, I gotta? Or, I'm I'm the FOMO guy in general, fear yeah. of missing out, absolutely, <laughs> but um. Huh. I, I'm definitely on the. Uh, I probably, unfortunately, I'm a, I feel a, I'm a bit conservative in this category. Uh, I, I I don't totally get the NFT thing. I'm going to be challenging Aween about that. Cryptocurrencies. I'm excited about because of the excitement of people who come up to me with zealous, you know, preacher like uh, uh, <laughs> dissertations on why I should be investing. But uh, but it kind of freaks me out too. I mean, I, I you know, I, I don't really. I, I'm old school enough to to wonder about things that I can't touch. I know. You know, I still yeah. own some vinyl records. You know, <laughs> oh, even though I, I make my playlists on the streaming services. So I, I I don't know. You know, I, I know that we're we're going into a mm. digital currency world, mm. but I don't know if I if I'm there yet to mm. be investing. In, in that, what about you? No, I I, I would do it. I would do it. I'm, oh, I'm you haven't a, yet? No, I haven't yet. Why, why not? Well, What's that. Well, back? why not? Exactly. Well, if you're so here's the thing. The, the swashbuckler. Yeah. Dude, I haven't you know? had time. <laughs> and if I had time, I would edit more. Let's put it that way. But uh, but no, the uh, I would no, do Reza, it. I know I you well enough. It. I would do it. I would totally you do it. if you you have time. I if you thought that. there was money uh, to be made, <laughs> you will you're make still, that. You're yeah. still, oh, you're still you sitting on the fence. That's you're it. sitting on the fence, right? A little bit, a little yeah. bit. No, but I'm, I'm. Here's the thing. <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm 90% there now. That's why I'm very curious to see what our guests have to say. Like, I want to be 100% before jumping. Well, and the other thing is the Iran connection. Like the fact that crypto, these digital currency mines, mm-hmm. Iran is number five in the world. That's crazy. In well, terms of, so I, I'm really curious. Sense. How does it make sense? Because Iran is sanctioned, they can move mm. money around. This is an amazing way to move la- like uh, launder, uh, launder money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, 
<laughs> True, but this, is, it. But, but this is yes. government sanction. This is the state involved in crypto, yeah. right? Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Anyway, there's only one person in our roundtable who works in finance, and it isn't you, Reza, <laughs> I know, that's or right. Shia, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> so Shia, that would be Shia writes his budget on a small <laughs> memo pad to make sure, you know, yeah. I spent $3 <laughs> on chocolate. I spent $4 on rice. Yeah. Shia is Gian's I'm impression of Shia sounds like an old <laughs> Italian man. Italian at Saint Clair and Duff French. Oh, I did my I was His doing accent's gotten better. Good. It yeah, used yeah, to be so shit. So let me turn to the finance person before <laughs> yeah. we get derailed here. <laughs> Keon, loose, Keon, loose. June, you yes, work in Dalen. finance. Dalen. What are your feelings about cryptocurrency? Okay. About the new digital? Would you invest in uh, all all manner of crypto? I so mean, before I, we have these conversations, I work for an institutional pension fund, the biggest, in fact, in Canada. Uh, Canada Pension Plan. So we have to do our due diligence. We owe we owe it to the Canadian population. We cannot take risks. And in my opinion, crypto is just there's a lot more work that needs to be done, at least like from an institutional investment perspective. Like there's no we're built we're currently building out a department that's going to dedicate time to this because you need to invest some time before you can invest millions and millions of dollars mm -hmm. on a personal level i have like like reza i haven't had enough time to really because i don't like yeah, to invest yeah. money without knowing what the sure. fuck i'm doing yeah, yeah. i have to take the time read some books yeah. watch youtube videos what the fuck is this yeah, like really yeah. give me the mechanics i don't want the bullshit yeah. you know a lot a, a lot of friends of mine are like oh my god you're missing out blah 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 it, it's it takes like mere enough. mere 24 hours before those same people turn yeah. around and cry and the other side of the coin, coin is um reza i'm gonna ask you have mm -hmm. you seen the um it's on netflix it's called trust no one the hunt for the crypto king no i haven't okay. oh, i saw the trailer but so I'm actually watching. so it's the story of the first uh canadian mm -hmm. crypto um platform that started like what i think over 10 years ago I went to high school with the wife of that gentleman no that started way. it. It's a crazy story. So basically, millions and millions of dollars of investors' money was just gone because oh. apparently yeah, Reza. There's different. I don't, I don't know why we're angry at Reza. So and, and you know yeah. these those, those, same, those same people would have been Always. story those, of my life. I mean those, they were on the right track if uh, the, those same people that invested money they would have been multimillionaires by now. So this guy oh. you know it's a it's it's something worth right. watching. Well, but anyway, well, wait to I mean, we, crypto but, and, and again so if you're listening to this wondering what crypto even is, yeah. I want to get I'll do the definitions with. Uh, this may sound better, but she's a really, uh, he's a super smart guy, mm. and he does uh, talks on this, and, and uh, he may, I mean, I'll be interested, we'll uh, reconvene this roundtable mm. after we've had our guests on, because uh, they both, uh, I think, are going to make the case for, I know Alwine is, a, is an NFT enthusiast, so she's certainly going to make the case for NFTs, and, and May Sam is, I mean, he's a co-founder of a crypto farm himself, mm. so he's going to be pro cryptocurrency so um we'll have those conversations we'll, we'll 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 get to that let me do some official hellos hi captain reza hello, hello sir groovy hello sir a groovy shy hi as them and hello the fabulous key i saw that you went to the opera this weekend i did you looked I really did. you you guys a smashing couple oh thank that's you. a beautiful that's picture of these these two at the it's opera just, yeah, they go to opera and stuff <laughs> it's I only on social stuff, media yes <laughs> Kia, <laughs> the, reza, have you, you've you gone like to the, the opera right of course I have you seen opera. La Travietta? Of course. And for those that don't know opera, you've no. seen Pretty Woman, uh, oh, Reza, oh, right? Oh, we're not talking about uh, Oprah, opera. Yes, 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 yes opera. <laughs> if, you, if you've seen Pretty Woman, La Travietta was the opera that they went to. It's oh. if you Honestly, you know what, Reza? I love take? the way Kia, I'm finding okay. ways to explain Reza. things to Reza. Uh, you Reza. find a movie, yeah, yeah. there's an opera <laughs> yeah. in it. <laughs> yeah. uh, have you seen yeah. Yeah. Reza, Reza, have you seen the Bugs Bunny cartoon? <laughs> yes, yes, I have. <laughs> That'll explain rabbit. who Verity yeah. is. Uh. Reza, you're in the doghouse with your girlfriend right now. Take her. To the opera, there. take I'm her to the opera. Trust me, it's a fantastic. You know, date I night. should do that. She likes dress. Actually, women they all do. Like she, yeah. she'll dress okay, up. We'll, we we'll have a May, May evening. Of Not it. all people like dressing up. Most people do. All right. Like once you know, in a blue moon is okay. Let, let me let, let me ask you. So yes, the, yes, let me sir. go to Shia. Uh, oh. I was thinking when uh, so about this opera thing uh -huh. because I, I I am an opera fan as well, uh -huh. but. Uh, it, it, do you? And by the way, if you're not, you're probably not an opera fan, right? 
Hazel? I've never been. If you go, uh huh. But oh, you, you, you I, don't. I, I, at I like home, it. you don't listen to the opera. No, so. sometimes I do. Oh, you do. Oh, yeah, because well, I gotta find music for editing, so I listen to all sorts of things. Because let me tell you something. Things. If you ever read the libretto, yeah. which is the lyrics, yeah, right? Yeah. So when I was, uh, I was like twenty-three years old or something, and I remember I'd never. I never, I never got opera. I never understood what the, you know, uh, this kind of sounded like a, some guy standing on stage, you know, mm-hmm. yelling for, you know, and uh, and I sat on my couch with uh, La Boheme, which is a very mm-hmm. popular opera. It's a very easy entree into mm-hmm. opera, right? And um, and if you read the libretto, so if you take your little, um, uh, these would be CDs when I was, uh, you know, this is like fucking two decades ago or whatever. I'm sitting there and and the the. Uh, I'm playing La Boheme and reading along with it, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the libretto, in, the translation in English, because mm-hmm. obviously it's, it's in Italian, it's Pavarotti. Right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm kind of like, ah, and then I'm reading, and all of a sudden I break down in tears. Oh. Wow. Like it is so powerful. Yeah. Once you're in it, once you're in the zone, mm-hmm. you ever see those... Um, those 3D paintings yes, yes, or, yes, or yes. pictures, and you go, and you go, uh, I don't get it, I don't get and it. I don't, find holy it. shit! Then suddenly you see it, yeah, and you're yeah, like, yeah. Ah, it blows your mind. Yeah. That's what I think opera is like. Once you get it, yeah. once you're in you're it, hooked. you're hooked, and it's so powerful. Mm. But anyway, I was thinking about um, oh, Iran that, and man. Iranians. Mm-hmm. There isn't really, uh, no. I mean. There's no opera in no, Iran, right? No, no, no. And do people like? Actually, we there is some opera. Yeah, I have. Yeah, like uh, recently, actually, in like five years ago, there were some. Um, like, it, it's an opera, but, but I'm guessing in the last forty-two years, there hasn't been a touring production of no. Puccini come and oh, play no, in Tehran, no, right? No, no, no. So, uh, it, and it's interesting because we had Ali Reza Gorbani on no. the show mm. last week, um, the incredible, you know, singer who is. What he does vocally is, you might say, operatic, even mm. though, of course, he's not an opera singer. Um, but but I, I don't even, or, or would you say, is there an appetite in Iran uh, for opera? Would, would, would People so, would know who Pavarotti is, obviously. Yeah. But Actually, um, there, there is a type of opera, which is Persian opera, which, like, let's say, Homayuna Shajarian and Ali Reza Gorbani, yes. they do in mm. a Persian traditional singing, they did some music musical show mm. which they call it uh, like opera molana they come on a stage oh. and sang and sing rumi poems rumi in, in poems. opera style in, yeah in a story the, there is a story and they are the the actors of that act mm. and yeah which i am actually I, I love that kind of opera but you know since it was uh, restricted i'm sure if they open up a little bit there is a huge mm-hmm. appetite for do you opera. but is it your sense that i don't know a lot of iranians in our huge community here in toronto that go to the no, opera no you no know, it's not no. it's not one of the things on the list yeah and it's funny because do. me and salma my boyfriend we uh we speak persian when we want to speak in like secret <laughs> we were making fun of you know a few characters <laughs> on, like who were it's harder there. to do that now and in we Toronto, heard right? we heard a, a young girl speaking to her mother we heard <laughs> and i was like shh there's, there's, there's Persians <laughs> among us and I turned around it was so, they did the same thing and I turned I was like are you guys Persian they're like no Armenian we thought you guys were doing it. <laughs> so it was just hilarious so we thought we were safe but well it anyway, used to be that 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 your per- Farsi speaking Persian yeah. was the secret code <laughs> right, right. in Toronto because nobody anymore. would understand but now there's so many Persians <laughs> right, here that, right. but, uh, so, but not at the opera yeah no yeah. I mean I'm sure there's mm. some Persians that go but not many right. yeah well, not, not many young people to be honest that's no, why they have a, yeah. like incentives to try to get more young yeah, people in there yeah. but i mean it is not cheap it's a, no but it is for people under 30 under they 30 pay, is like 70 percent dude off or you some. pay 35 dollars for whatever date um yeah. and you get placed in seats that are like 300 right. turning into a very toronto centric right no <laughs> there's people listening all around the world but but yes i love the idea i one of the things i love that you go to the opera Keon, I really do. It, you it's, you captured it, it perfectly. Yeah. Once you you have to go, Reza. No, and you that's just, why I mm, after you said I said thank you powerful. because I never thought of it that way. It was always like I'm just I'm interested in the music of it. Never understood yeah. the acting. It was very and the like, thing that's the way animated. we think of arts. Uh, oftentimes, opera is considered a fine art, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we will we will sort of prejudicially. Um, think that it's not for us, yeah. mm. you know. Oh, that's yeah. that's not for me. I'm a, 
I'm a punk kid or I'm a, you know, I'm into yeah. rock music mm-hmm. or whatever it is that I'm, and, and, and you realize, I mean, there's a reason why this tradition, first of all, hundreds of years ago, opera wasn't the, for the, you know, rich yeah. moneyed class. It was, it was yeah. populist, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. but second of all, um, there's a reason why this has moved generations of people. There's a reason why people, they're like crying, watching yeah. Pavarotti mm-hmm. because it really is incredibly emotive stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they, and it, and it's not, there's no car races or like, you know, explosions. Like <laughs> you're just watching a couple of people on stage, yeah. but it's so powerful. It is interesting. Thing because uh, like I watch I love silent movies I I'm like fix infixiated by them like I love it but uh, it's you're 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 what by them I'm fix I'm fix I'm fixated by them you're what fixated on them yeah. I'm fixated on them yeah. 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 You're not, you're not asphyxiated by them, <laughs> yeah, which would be you know, choked by them. Yeah. I said yeah. asphyxiated? Yes, you, did. you said I something. Said, I'm not I'm sure what you said. By that. To be honest, I, I don't I know what most of the things you say are, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm inventing new words, but uh, like it's a thing that people say. Oh, why do you watch like silent movies? Like it's old. It's that you don't get. Like it's s- simple story, but it's 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 very mm. hypnotizing. Like I can't get enough of it. Mm. And I, when you said that, I'm like, I hope that I can find that in uh, opera too. I'm definitely going to give it a go try. Go for sure. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you like you like to dabble in marijuana and shrooms. And <laughs> yeah, if yes. you like, honestly, yeah. it's, dabble it's, is right. it's Keon's answer to everything these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get, no, but really, get wasted. You, just, uh, <laughs> you already feel it without. It, but man, uh, this was the first time I I tried marijuana before, uh, and going to the opera. Let me tell you, explosive! It was just yeah. really oh, eh? amazing. Oh, son, nice, yeah. nice, nice, nice. What about yes. Shia? Why don't you want Shia to go? I don't to the know opera? why. He I is think walking opera. I, I, I feel like Shia already knows about opera. Reza bad bechte. Why come back? Yeah, culturally, yeah, well, it's constantly <laughs> trying to culture <laughs> Reza. Yeah, right. I, we Shia, just assume <laughs> Shia. You like know. Shia, I'm assuming you you have listened to opera before, like yes, you know, opera. yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and you're a fan? You like? Of course, music? yeah, of okay. course. See, what I, I mean, it, it, I don't need to tell Shia. Yeah, but it's a bit expensive. I have to yeah, say. Yeah, I agree. So. I agree. But yeah, I love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a well. Anyway, Keon, uh, it looks like you had a nice weekend. And and the other problem with Persians and opera is operas don't start two hours oh, two hours yeah. after the start. You can't time. be late. Yeah, you know this this yeah. Persian. Thing, so <laughs> you went to a concert this weekend. Uh, I don't yeah. even know if we should oh, say. Yeah. It. But, yeah. but 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 uh, oh. but Shia went to a, a Persian concert. Wait, and I was like, and I was like, when did it start? Oh and he was God. like, you know, because the ticket's like eight, eight o'clock yeah. or something, you know. Nine, sure enough. Nine, ten, it starts like. Oh, that's hour. not so bad. No, it's so bad. <laughs> but, well, no, I mean, I, yours, I be, I've been to some where they start like two, two hours. Oh, but okay. I bet half the audience wasn't even there at eight o'clock, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's unbelievable. That's, this such a, that's so funny how it's like structured that way, you know? But I'm telling you, like. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like they know that, right? Like they, they do. Know, it's they baked know. in. Yeah. yeah. Time yeah, yeah. is a loose word, you know? It's not even a I had a Persian girlfriend and I would always think that I'd be like, the tickets say we where it's it's 845. She'd be like, don't worry, don't worry. She, they like, like, they know some of these persons yeah. they know yeah. they know they got it somehow there's some clock inside them like yeah. it's actually going to start at 9 43 you know instead yeah. of 8 p.m yeah. i wonder how like can we do things that need precise like timing like we want to send there's a no rocket way. to space there's so a, right I, at 9 a.m sharp it's like 9 15 are we going to send it yeah. like oh, <laughs> yeah, no it's a disaster yeah. it's a disaster uh, I wanted to say something about this weekend or the last few days. Uh, we we when we we sometimes we talk about people we've lost in the world, uh-huh. rest in peace, and we talk usually about Iranians because that's the focus of our show. But it, but there was a great Canadian, um, if I if I can be Canada centric for a second, who died in the in the last few days, uh, named Guy Lafleur. Mm-hmm. Now you guys probably oh, don't remember yeah. Guy Lafleur, do you? Because uh, both because you weren't in this country and also because. Maybe you're a little young, although if you'd grown up here, for sure you would know who he is. Guy Lafleur was one of the greatest hockey players ever, oh. played for the Montreal Canadiens. And his heyday was the late 70s and early 80s, when he was literally the flashiest and best hockey player in the world. Now, I never met Guy Lafleur, and uh, I got I had the opportunity to do him, interview a bunch of hockey players in the last 20 years and stuff, but never Guy Lafleur. I never even got the, I don't even know if I was ever in the same room as Guy Lafleur. But I have a connection to him because when we first came to Canada, 
first of all, uh, like I was eight, seven, eight years old when we came here, and immediately I started playing hockey because that's what kids do, you know, when mm. they, uh, and I'd grown up in England, and so I, the only sport that I'd really played was soccer, soccer football, yeah. you know, which I was pretty good at, and I remained good at all through into my 20s. I was always a good soccer player, um, like a really good player and a really, really bad hockey player. <laughs> like just like disastrous, like horror show. Like And 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 I started when I was eight or something. And, uh, and like when you're eight years old, all the players are kind of the same, you know, like there's a couple of kids who are a little better. But then each year, you know, mm. like I'm the only person who got worse each year. Like, <laughs> like all the, as all the other kids got better, yeah. you know, I got worse. And like by the time I was in my teens, like – you kept my, you kept going. Oh, until I kept your going. I, I don't know what the hell I was doing. Why didn't you quit? I, and, and, and and like no, I'm and no so word good. of a lie. Like they would carry me off the like, <laughs> stretchers. Like my parents would be That's like, you so know, fun. call the ambulance. <laughs> oh like the the coach would like not put me on in the last That's four like minutes an of the game. Was <laughs> no, I gotta go no. back. I was in. like the team would just be like like hope that I don't turn up. Like it's a tragedy. it was so bad. It's its own opera. And I I was such a hockey. I still am. I like a hockey so fan weird. but and so in the summers when we would play <laughs> soccer oh, i'd soccer. be like the captain of the team i'd be yeah. scoring goals and, and then winter would come and i'd just be like was it, was oh it? my god you know <laughs> i mean i remember there was a time when like i, re, I like they literally <laughs> carried me off the ice. <laughs> <laughs> so much shame. my father with his hands in his head like a head in his hands like oh my you know god. just like this is a you know uh, what I, I, I mean, it was just terrible. Was it a way to fit in? Like, why? I don't understand. If you suck at something, why continue it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> That's my motto. it took me until I was, I think it was about when 15 or something, when it was becoming a danger to my, like, existence. Like, I was probably going <laughs> to be uh, killed or something. Because then that's know. when you start really hitting each other, right? For people who don't well, know. Well, it's not just hitting each other. It's like body checks. Yeah, and, the, body and, the, checks and the big kids, I wasn't that big, too. I was skinny and, you know. <laughs> so I was just getting, you got to be, you either have to be really big or you have to be an amazing skater mm. and I was oh. neither of those oh. so like but you, you know, liked it though you enjoyed it I, I loved it I loved you hockey loved but I know I hated playing I always oh, I always hated it because I was so bad <laughs> I was and I just Sorry, hated man. it more and more so it was humiliating and also like and you know I was also remember this is the 80s and stuff I was like a you know, not not many people on the on the team look like me, yeah, and yeah, so I wrote yeah. about this in my book about how, yeah. uh, you know, I'm That's the worst true. player and I'm the brown kid and mm. the, or like the you know ethnic kid, and yeah. so that was just a bad yeah. a bad combination. You know, yeah. they would just be like, you know, there were things that were said under the breath oh, or sometimes yeah. on the ice mm. that mm. I don't want to repeat. They were just you know horrible, right? Yeah. So, but anyway, my point is. My point is, is that point. there was a point when I went when I was uh, eight years, I guess grade five, grade four. I don't know what I guess maybe eight or nine years old. Uh, there was a public speaking. There was the first public speaking contest or something in our mm. school, in our public school. And uh, and I won the speech contest. Wow. Yeah, I did a little speech. And I, yeah, I probably had an English accent. And I did a little speech. And my speech was about Gila Fleur. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah. Gila Fleur, or the flower, as he's known, you know, is one of the greatest <laughs> hockey players. And so... Uh, David so Attenborough. I <laughs> always, I, I always yeah, had this like uh, relationship with Guy Lafleur because oh. you know the one, th the thing, little thing that I won when I was a kid was you know doing a little speech about Guy Lafleur. Yeah, that's so, awesome. There you go. Yeah, wow. rest in peace to uh, I haven't done his legacy the, 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 what it deserves by saying I did what a speech about him when I was you suck at hockey that's, <laughs> yeah, what that's, what, that's the takeaway and Guy Lafleur was great that's the that's all you need to know uh, last week we had Ali Reza Gorbani on the show we have a lot of uh, letters to get to about that this Thursday on the contemporary history of Iran the Golha legacy mm -hmm. mm. this is the uh, radio series that ran in Iran yes from 1956 to Till the revolution yep. that revolutionized mm -hmm. uh, Persian music, basically in Iran, in in terms of bringing it to the mm -hmm. fore, making it accessible, uh, appointment programming. We'll we'll do a contemporary history of Iran episode on the Golha legacy. And then next Monday, Captain Behnam is oh. our. Uh, feature yeah, guest, the uh, the pilot who uh, was um, saved a, a, a over 300 lives on a United flight a few years ago. You might remember that story. If you don't, it's an incredible story, and we're excited to have him for a feature interview. So we got the letters of the week coming up. Yes, they're coming up later. 
All right, let's get to the metaverse and then reconvene to discuss whether you've changed your minds. The fabulous Keon, Groovy Shia, and uh, Captain Reza stick around. Let's get to our feature guests. You've heard about the metaverse, Bitcoin, and cryptocurrencies, but you're not sure whether you want to dip your toes into these new digital waters or you have no idea what those words even mean. And even if you do, should you trust new digital currencies and be investing in this area? And what are the implications of a new borderless digital universe for closed societies like Iran and relatedly for the Iranian diaspora? Is this a new democratic frontier or a new way of advancing state control? And how and why is Iran in the top five of countries mining cryptocurrency in the world today? My first guest is a political analyst and a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at Lund University, Sweden. Meisam Behravesh was born and raised in Iran. He received his master's in British studies with a special focus on international relations from the University of Tehran. He has written numerous articles in journals such as Foreign Policy and for Al Jazeera. He has served as a research associate at the Netherlands Institute of International Relations as a multimedia journalist with Iran International, and as a political analyst at the U.S.-based Persis Media. He also worked as an intelligence analyst and policy advisor in Iran between 2008 and 2010. Currently, Maysam is the co-founder of the Maimonat Anna Crypto Farm in Sweden. He aims to build sustainable crypto farms across Sweden by scaling a research-driven and market-tested trading methodology. We'll get into what all of that means right now. Maysam Behravesh joins me from Malmo, Sweden today. Hello, sir. Hi, and uh, thank you very much uh, for a very kind uh, introduction, and uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's very nice to have you on the program, May Salmon. And to, to dig into this subject, I have to uh, uh, issue the disclaimer to you that a lot of us don't uh, aren't as advanced in this area as, as you are. So uh, I'm going to treat this as an elementary in interview around the metaverse, around cryptocurrencies, uh, and get into the basics uh, before I ask you some of perhaps more philosophical questions of where this fits for uh, Iranians listening around the world and inside Iran. Let me start off with the most elemental question. Uh, in your simplest explanation, what is cryptocurrency? Yeah, uh, good, uh, very uh, important fundamental question, actually. So uh, cryptocurrency, to put it very uh, briefly, is a new form of money, is a new form of currency that is produced digitally, by uh, solving computational puzzles. And this is revolutionary because it is, for the first time in history, it is uh, possible to produce that kind of money, not just as a state, not as a bank, but as an ordinary individual. So that's why lots of people are uh, talking about democratization of money and are referring to, to uh, crypto as, um, as a driver, as a source of democratizing uh, money and capital. And, uh, right now, as we are uh, talking, uh, it's the, the market share of uh, cryptocurrency in terms of its share of the global market global economy is around three trillion dollars over three trillion dollars so okay. it's a digital currency uh, also significantly that has no nation state there's no there's no picture of the queen or a prime minister uh, mm -hmm. on it uh, and it's something that you can't hold in your hand as well right uh, yes, uh, depending um, what uh, the owner or the, the, the initiator uh, of that coin has in mind, uh, whether they have uh, physical coins or not. But yes, uh, and uh, just one uh, clarification, crypto is a little bit different from digital, like almost the same, but the difference is that digital money is usually uh, issued and uh, produced by banks, mm. by states, by you know, by, by an authority. Crypto is decentralized, I and see. that's that's how it is democratized. Crypto is a digital currency, but it isn't just digital currency. More, more than that. Oh, right, yeah, exactly. right. Got you. So I think that you did a great job. I mean, that's a good basic explainer. 
Um, why? Where do I even begin? I know that you uh, trade in, you use, you engage in cryptocurrency. Tell us why, for example, you've decided to engage in it. Well, if uh, if I should be honest, I, um, as you kindly introduced, I was, for the most part, doing um, journalism, political analysis, and I was doing it as a freelancer. And over the past couple of years, um, it's not been very smooth and easy uh, or, uh, or adequately rewarding, to be honest. So I was looking for a way out. And I remember, uh, I think it was April, last year, April, uh, when Bitcoin suddenly skyrocketed and it made lots of noise and you know, kind of grabbed headlines and you know, people started talking about it. So, uh, no, and I had that exposure on Twitter, on social media here and there. So that was a trigger. And I was encouraged by you know, friends, uh, by uh, family to give it a shot. Just give it a shot. So I started that. I, um, I'm not going to name names, but I uh, started with a very uh, basic uh, high fee app. And then uh, I got a bit more interested, uh, moved on to the next app, a bit more advanced, and then moved on to the next app. So uh, this incrementally went on, um, and I learned more, I gained more, I uh, also expanded more in terms of uh, familiarizing myself with uh, not just uh, crypto uh, currencies or crypto coins, but also with uh, uh, NFTs uh, with uh, trading in the first place, also with uh, mining. Okay, so you're sorry, you're explaining how you got involved, but but not why. In in the simplest terms, why did you engage in it to to make money? That too, I mean, not just <laughs> to make money, but okay. that was obviously uh, um, a, a core element. But uh -huh. I was good in math. Uh, back back in school, so that helps a lot in terms of uh, formulating, in terms of strategizing, in terms of like uh, trying to identify market patterns. Uh, also, thanks to my background, my uh, doctoral background in uh, political psychology of security, I have the chance to understand the market psychology a little bit better. Mm. So, believe it or not, I do not know most of the coins I'm working with. I just look at the graph, how it goes up and down. So I think that's important. What, I what is it? Sorry, that. what does that mean? You don't know most of the coins you're working with? I mean, I don't know like the purpose of the coin. I, I do not necessarily know uh, where this coin comes from, as long as it's listed. Awesome. And as long as I can follow the behavior not the coin itself, the content or whatever. I really don't know the philosophy behind it or who, who is behind it, which corporation or uh, the, the, the blockchain technology uh, in, um, at the heart of it. I just follow the behavior of the coin in the market and the market psychology helps. Okay. Is there, is just anecdotally or, or parenthetically, I guess uh, as a sidebar, is there a minimum amount that somebody needs to have to get involved in cryptocurrency? In other words, do you have to have currency to engage in cryptocurrency? Zero. Nothing. Nothing. So it's not necessarily just for rich people? Oh, not at all. This is actually for uh, very poor people who are getting the chance perhaps for the first time in history, honestly, for the first time, like um, poor, impoverished women, children in far off villages around the world, as long as long as they have access to the internet and they have a mobile to download apps, and that's also been made possible. So uh, this is really interesting uh, that um, let's say a, a cryptocurrency like Shiba Inu is simply sustained by the retail support. It is, uh, it is a very small, like in terms of the uh, dollar value, it's a very small, but very famous and popular uh, cryptocurrency. But but and Mesa, it doesn't, uh, sorry to cut you off, I'm trying to move it along here. Wouldn't, wouldn't you problem. accept that if you don't, 
the, the, the more money you have or the more resources you have, let's say it that way, the more latitude you have to be able to experiment with new ideas, right? If you don't have a lot yeah. of money yeah. and you put it into Bitcoin and, and it doesn't work out, you have a lot more to lose, no? That's just one aspect of a cryptocurrency where you are required to invest and gain. Now, now we have, as we are moving forward uh, in this uh, very uh, interesting, very revolutionizing world, there are um, blockchains, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, apps that act as auto miners. You just install it, it mines, it, it produces money for you, just like that. I can name like Pi Network with more, 1 million, with over 1 million followers on uh, Twitter, Blue Tick, um, you know, they have a website. It, it's very serious, developed by Stanford uh, scientists and engineers. So this is an auto money. You just install it and it's based on, so you invite people, you build, the, the more uh, you expand your uh, base, the more people you invite, the faster it produces money for you. Or we have a couple of apps that generate a cryptocurrency uh, for you that is convertible into cash later, mm -hmm. uh, per step taken, you walk, it pays you. This is crazy. Well, well this is, the, <laughs> but part of what you're saying is, so no is money. It, no part money. of what you're saying oh. is exactly the reason why uh, I think people are unsure about this because everyone, uh, especially but once you hit a certain age, you realize that there's no free lunch in the world. You're not, nobody gives you anything for free. <laughs> and I have to say, just in the last couple of weeks, I mean, I guess post-COVID, we're back to gatherings, parties. I'm, I'm going out. I see people. Three different people, uh, two of them I don't really even know that well. They were introduced to me have tried to sell me on getting in, involved in investing in a certain cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or, and, um, and the look in their eyes is like, they're trying to sell me cocaine. You know I mean? It's this like crazed, like you got to get involved in this. You're going to make so much money, you know, <laughs> which, which is part of the reason why I go, okay, maybe I'll, I'll sit yeah. this one out for a couple more months. You know, what do you say to folks who out there who perhaps understandably are tentative about getting involved in something that still feels uh, speculative that is ultimately unregulated, which is part of the sell of it, but is part of the reason why it might be of concern as well. Um, I would I would say uh, as long as you are careful, as you are with your bank account, as you are with your PayPal or with your you no know, online uh, financial you no know, personal accounts. Uh, it is not much different, to be honest. Actually, crypto uh, crypto work is safer because of the, the the robust encryption at heart of it. But anyway, I would say, give it a shot. You know, there are some apps, some cryptocurrencies where you do not even have to invest. You don't do anything. You just install the app, like you install hundreds of apps mm -hmm. to play or do whatever. You install it, and it will do the job for you. Just that. But if you want to... But, but. And I'll make money in... <laughs> I love this. I mean, this this is, is my favorite part of this. This is incredible. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> That's it. I can quit. We can all quit working. We just install an app and uh, and we get rich. Uh, I I'm walk. Okay. There are, this is, there's, I know two apps. They uh, pay you per step taken. So they you walk to earn. Uh-huh. Uh, there are other schemes. So they, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, have, sorry, sorry. You walk, yeah, and you you make money by walking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, it pays you per step taken. So you like walk uh, twenty thousand steps. Like I walk a lot, so I huh. I'm gonna get rich soon. Huh? And, and what do you? <laughs> and how can and can this money help you buy a sandwich at uh, the local deli? Yeah. Uh, it can, uh -huh. but you, you need to walk a little bit and you need to invite <laughs> friends so that the, the reward is... But I have already, you know, I installed this app just a couple of days ago and I have already um, ordered a bracelet, uh, the kind of silver bracelet uh -huh. or something like that um, with a certain letter from a company which has a contract with this app. 
And I have just used those walking money. <laughs> I haven't. And you got a bracelet. Uh, you do. You do know that. I mean, there's the old joke about people selling that. It wasn't a joke. It was based in reality. Right. People selling the deed to the Brooklyn Bridge, or or people, you know, yeah. uh, selling a, a piece of land yeah. in a, a country that doesn't exist, or whatever. I mean, uh, um, you know, yeah. the Nigerian prince that asks for money on the internet, uh, all, all of that <laughs> stuff. It, it, I get lost. it starts to it starts to sound a little bit like that. You, but uh, you know, having said that, there are people I profoundly respect who are engaging in this yourself included so I, I I don't want to minimize it too much I mean clearly there's a there's something to be had there and by the way um, the reason why I I the moment when I realized the metaverse uh, and cryptocurrencies are serious stuff was when big corporations uh, started uh, getting involved and I sort of go okay if Disney is getting involved then I know this is the, you know the, something serious this is not a or, or something that uh, there, there's a lot of advantage to be gained you have made the case may Sam that there are three groups that are currently engaging in crypto um, the individuals like normal people like uh, you and I um, states the state and then crypto capitalists if you can uh, just walk us through those three groups so we talked about uh, the cryptocurrencies potential as uh, an emancipatory um, uh, monetary uh, source so in the sense that it is decentralized it helps democratize money so uh, people um, who are in some impoverished far off regions of the world suddenly thanks to crypto become part of the global economy they engage they trade they you know okay uh, so the, the whole philosophy behind this uh, is to uh, demonopolize money is to uh, make money uh, more inclusive rather than exclusive by taking it away from intermediaries like Western Union. This is really interesting. Uh, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Western Union, thanks to El Salvador's introduction or, or recognition of a Bitcoin as legal tender. Yes. And, and because uh, money transfer or crypto transfer is much cheaper much much cheaper than normal transactions financial transactions through exchanges like western union and i read somewhere that uh, only because of uh, el salvador uh, western union has uh, is is estimated to lose uh, 700 million or 400 million uh, dollars a year or something like that i mean because it is being deprived of uh, all those transactions that mm. it profited from. Uh, so when it comes to groups, there are states, uh, I named, uh, I mentioned El Salvador, uh, there are other states uh, like China, where most of the mining is happening, like Iran, uh, which you uh, mentioned as one of the top five mm -hmm. um, uh, mining countries in the world, uh, United States, uh, Britain, Sweden, so states, what states do, they try to regulate this and uh, bring this under control in a way that it would not destabilize national markets. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's what the states do. And they have, for the most part, they have been confronted, crypto has confronted them with a governance dilemma, actually. So on the one hand, they uh, want to keep it in check uh, by um, imposing uh, considerable uh, taxes, by um, imposing restrictions. Uh, but then the developers, the, the technological, uh, the scientific infrastructure, the talent, mm. is encouraged to leave the national territory, go mine and do crypto work, elsewhere and elsewhere meaning another national territory mm. which then stands to benefit uh there are many chinese miners in london in the united states and they have moved or let's say app developers or encryptors or uh computer scientists who are involved in crypto work 
who have moved out of China because of the crackdown. Let me just clarify so that people know, because uh, you're referencing. First of all, you you mentioned El Salvador. I believe El Salvador a couple of years ago or last year became the first country in the world that has yeah. declared cryptocurrency Bitcoin as a legal tender, as a as a currency, legal right? Tender. Legal tender. Um, China, interestingly, that is, since you're saying it's one of the top. Uh, the top. Uh, China is number one. It's number one, but it's also banned the currency, right? It, it, it's it's cracked down on the currency. So it's an interesting uh, paradox. I have that lost track how many times they have banned and then they have um, kind of uh, unbanned it. And, I see. You know, they have, it's been lots of back and forth. I see. Let me just, I just want to clarify some of the terms too, because you just got ahead of us a little bit there. We were talking about three groups, the individuals, the state, and the crypto uh, capitalists. Uh, we'll get to the crypto capitalists. Um, just while we're talking about the state, and you've you've been talking, you've mentioned a couple of times mining crypto. Can you just explain what that means? What does it mean to be mining a currency? Um, without uh, wading into uh, its uh, technical and technological detail, mining currency is uh, basically uh, generating using um, a tool, an app, uh, to generate a certain cryptocurrency, uh, which you can later convert into cash, which you la can later uh, convert into Bitcoin or other coins or just Euro cash. That's, that's the, uh, I think, the uh, easiest definition. It's crypto money production or generation. But, uh, but uh, le if you don't mind, let me just finish that, uh, that categorization. Sure, uh, the sure. The groups that are dealing with, uh, with crypto states are trying to regulate as i said individuals like everyone else is um trying to make gains um on, on an organic scale okay an individual cannot uh, affect the market uh, if the gain uh, is uh, organic mm. we do have ways or those who hold uh, a, a huge amount of uh, cryptocurrency or bitcoin or uh, USDT, Ethereum, but crypto capitalists or corporations, particularly those who are holding Bitcoin, you know, there are only 21 million Bitcoins out there available. Uh, they are basically holding and thus capitalizing Bitcoin while neglecting the fact and actually contradicting uh, the fact that Bitcoin came to decapitalize money hmm. so they are treating something anti-capitalist right. in a totally capitalist way right although that's not a surprise is it it's not no it's not surprising and unfortunately this is the whole paradox at the heart of bitcoin yes it needs to be treated like money like uh, capitalist conventional money in order to be taken seriously and as you said disney is taking it seriously there's lots of profit involved or oh, uh, there are uh, like Mar Mark Cuban, uh, um, Elon Musk, uh, but they are making the same use of it. Uh, they are it's maximization of profit. Yes, yes. I mean, this is uh, this is one of the things. It, it's it's interesting. It reminds me a little bit of the early days of the internet. It reminds me of the great promise of the internet was uh, cyberspace is going to democratize everything. Everything is going to yeah, be, yeah. you know, everyone's going to get a chance now for the first time. And, of course, it didn't take long before um, the Internet became, you know, another example, if not a, a, an even more vicious example of inequity, you know, as um, corporations yeah. moved in, states started to regulate it, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it occurs to me that I because I, I know that early on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin was was very much championed by, you know, libertarians and uh, even anarchists. This is going to be, this is this new open thing. And the idea being at, at its simplest, I know I'm making this, I'm, I'm, this is reductive, but the idea being that these cryptocurrencies are a way to separate money from the state, 
right? This is a, this is a way to 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 run a currency that is separated from the state. And now you know states are involved in this uh, in, in in a big way, as you've been talking about. So let me yeah. use that as a segue to start talking about Iran and Iranians because. Um, it's not just a, uh, we, I mean, because there's a particular involvement of Iran in this. Iran being, um, there's not a lot of things that Iran's number five, in the top five of the world in, you know. Uh, crypto happens to be one of them, mining crypto. Why do you think that is the case? It's a very interesting question. Uh, Iran, and when we say Iran, and I mean mostly the government, the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, they are most interested in crypto, as um, almost all other states are interested, to make money, to to maximize uh, their profit to gain. But then Iran has further motivation, and uh, that is like um, bypassing sanctions or uh, mm. evading uh, sanctions, or basically filling uh, the the deficit, filling the gap caused by sanctions. But but what is uh, I think most important about about Iran's uh, crypto industry is that uh, this is uh, mostly led and marshaled uh, by China. So uh, Iran has been uh, relying on Chinese technology expertise and talent to uh, get this off the ground. But it is not clear what percentage or what extent of uh, this not a very cheap generation of money because they are using electricity they are not no they are not using wind power or solar power mm. as uh, they do in some parts of Europe in more environment friendly parts of Europe Iran is using electricity and uh, you hear news stories about uh, air pollution about power outages so this is a price paid by the society, by the people, but uh, it is far from clear who stands to gain um, ultimately. Where does this one billion dollar per annum annually go? And it is uh, equally unclear whether it goes, uh, whether the chunk of it uh, goes to China or it stays in Iran and is somehow used by the Islamic Republic, by the government, its institutions. Uh, so we, we, we can have three gain stages, uh, mostly controlled, uh, uh, mostly reaped by China, mostly taken by the state itself, or spread around in the society. I think the third option is uh, very unlikely. The second option uh, is uh, is less plausible than the than the first option. So uh, I it seems to me, uh, given the the indications, given the circumstantial evidence, uh, China is uh, China uh, is basically uh, taking the lion's share of uh, Iran's uh, crypto uh, gain. Okay, but uh, again, uh, I'm going to try and. Uh, reduce this to its simplest terms so that I can understand it. Um, speaking of paradoxes, uh, if if crypto mining is is being um, initiated or encouraged by the by the current government of Iran, we there there's all kinds of flags that that you know uh, raises about. Okay, well you know uh, th that would create more tr distrust of 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 the intentions at the very least, and yet. I would think on the face of it that cryptocurrency would be particularly um, good for Iranians, you know, in terms of there's almost no Iranian in the diaspora that doesn't understand the difficulty of trying to access and engage in financial uh, trade or, or uh, with, with folks inside Iran or with uh, um, uh, the economy inside Iran. So it leads to questions around the implications of the growth of cryptocurrencies for Iranians. What I would think this would be a positive and progressive step on some level for Iranians inside of the country, being able to engage in access funds inside and vice versa, bypassing closed borders, bypassing rules, bypassing sanctions. Is that not true? Yes, it is good. It is. Uh, it is. Um, it can be a win-win situation, both for the state and uh, the society. 
and it is uh, for the most part good for society. I, I believe uh, crypto uh, is a source of prosperity uh, for the Iranian side. But the problem, the fundamental problem, is that not only the state is cracking down on it, or cracking down in the sense of trying to bring it under scope, its own control, mm. trying to tax it, uh, trying to uh, be uh, the main actor in the market, okay, within the national territory, within the national borders. Uh, but there is also another problem. So uh, the state pressure on the one hand, or the state restrictions. But uh, there, uh, a more fundamental problem, I think, is sanctions, and that has caused a denial of access, a denial of service. Mm. So now I'm sending links to friends inside Iran, and they cannot download or stand to gain from these auto money makers. Why? Because uh, it, it's not available on Google app or apps, uh, App Store or Google Play, or simply the app does not recognize that territory. Right. So basically, right. it doesn't work. So being between a rock and a hard place, kind of, when it comes to Iranians' relationship with crypto. Right. Yeah, I mean, because right now, if I think about, uh, you know, uh, any number of friends I have, for example, that want to send money back to their family in Iran and have mm -hmm. to jump through hoops and go to some money exchange uh, place at a strip mall and, you know, sign a bunch of things and convert and send and, you know, um, if this were all able, able to be done through some sort of cryptocurrency with the press of a button, mm -hmm. it would certainly simplify things and democratize things, wouldn't it? That, that's definitely the case. Um, it it helps a lot, and I know people who uh, basically transfer Bitcoin and then you know take it to a, a, an exchange office, convert into cash. So they basically bypass the, uh, the, the the intermediaries. But then, if it is regulated and taxed and and controlled by the, by the state, we're back to where we were, uh, you know, or worse, right? Um, and, and I mean, you worked for it's a very unique. Uh, opportunity to get to talk to somebody like you because you worked inside the intelligence ministry. You worked for Iran's intelligence ministry. Presumably, you have a, it wasn't that long ago. You were there a decade ago. Presum with Iran's intelligence with okay, Iran's you know. Uh, <laughs> presumably, you have a sense of how the thinking goes inside the intelligence ministry. What 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 do you think the strategy is with? Uh, cryptocurrencies and the metaverse when it comes to Iran? Yeah, like most states, uh, no, there are commonalities and there are points of differentiation which basically differentiates Iran's uh, approach uh, or, uh, to this and Iran's treatment of this phenomenon. Uh, like most states, they quite needless to say uh, want to maximize their gains from this uh, newfound source of wealth. But uh, b because of the certain characteristics um, of the Iranian society uh, in terms of the state uh, nation relations, in terms of the state society relations, the state sees the benefit, but at the same time, they are uh, quite worried uh, about two things. One uh, being a crypto destabilizing the regulated um, economic uh, situation inside Iran, kind of, uh, kind of uh, undermining mm. uh, the economic order that has been pursued by certain um, governmental sectors, uh, by the government, generally mm. speaking. Mm. Well, there are uh, corporations, there are like IRGC, not not just a military organization, but also an economic powerhouse. The state does not want to lose its up hand, right? So they are basically stepping forth to control this uh, this uh, inflow hmm. of money or these uh, money generation uh, operations. But when it comes to um, trying uh, to maximize their share of the market to bring the market under their own control so that they can gain more mm -hmm. i think they are acting in uh, similarly in, a, in, in similar ways to other states and uh, iran is not an exception it might be an exception 
uh, when it comes uh, to the, the characteristic uh, shape and form of the state society relation, relations within Iran. But, you know, I don't know if this is entirely true, but I'll throw it out there. It feels like, certainly, if the paradigm of the, the 20th century, late 20th century, was that the West is ahead technologically and more closed societies or undemocratic societies or the developing world, whatever the terms we would be using at the time, uh, would react to that by kind of trying to shut it out, keep it away, try to control their their populations through the use of a, an iron wall, uh, that in mm-hmm. this case, certainly the actions of, say, the government of Iran suggests a real um, uh, attempt at getting ahead of the curve Oh, yeah. And uh, engage, you know, and wanting to actually get so far ahead of the curve to control this before it can be a real disruptive force, right? Yeah, because if the government doesn't get involved, the society will take over. Right. So there will be a miscellany of independent actors, mining, uh, trading, uh, connecting and uh, basically empowering themselves and others out of the sight and out of the control of the state. So on the international arena, uh, on the, uh, in the international sphere, states try to get ahead as, uh, as, mm. far, as far as they can. Within national territories, it is almost the same. Just in international uh, out there, it is between mm-hmm. states. Mm-hmm. Here inside, uh, it's between the state and other stakeholders, the, the, like uh, members of other members of society who are acting independently of the state. And that's why the IRGC, the Islamic Republic, is uh, getting uh, very much involved to be able to, uh, to control it, yes. to be able to gain from it. But in terms of the digital world in general, isn't it ultimately a losing battle to try to 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 control it to try and harness it and i mean they've they've lost the battle to try and prevent you know yeah. kids in tehran listening to radiohead right it's not it's not going to work you know and 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 you know when i think about the metaverse uh i was having a conversation with a friend of mine uh about for example um the possibility of you know say concerts that are going to be held in the the metaverse they're already starting to justin bieber did one you know and the ability for a kid in Tabriz to be able to mm. attend the concert in the metaverse the same way a kid in San, San Diego can. They, can. they can both go to the Abbey concert. They can be standing next to each other in the metaverse. Uh, that's a huge leap forward uh, in terms of undermining the closed nature um, of the, currently of Iranian um, popular culture, um, both for the the consumer and for the artist too. The artist suddenly has access to these the, these these fans that can come and come to the gig, right? So how how is the state going to be able to control something like that? Um. It's it's going to be increasingly difficult. This is um, by default on design, uh, not uh, something uh, to use for uh, it's used as a mechanism of control. It's exactly the opposite. Okay, uh, when it comes to AI, artificial intelligence, uh, which is very closely uh, connected to crypto work, encryption, and cryptography, and I believe I usually cite the example, the very basic example of autocorrect. You know, autocorrect, like when you when you are typing, you know, texting, uh, yeah. SMSing, this at times autocorrect takes over, and uh, it can easily ruin relationships. <laughs> autocorrect is, I would say, the most basic form of AI gone rogue. Just imagine. If AI uh, reaches uh, very advanced uh, stages, we will have a situation like Matrix. Some people have been warning about, I have myself uh, warned about, I'm tweeted about, and I'm writing about it, that this, the Matrix, like uh, I think the fourth episode or the fourth uh, section has uh, uh, come to the market. If AI takes over, 
then we will have to find uh, sanctuaries and safe havens within an AI-controlled system to hide. Wow, yeah. So we need to be careful about this kind of eventuality as well. So control, yes, loss of control can be this big as well, not just by states, but almost by everybody, by humanity. Can I, what, can I just ask you one final question before I let you go? What has surprised you in the evolution and popularity of, of, of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies so far? The disbelief, actually, that people just don't download it <laughs> and see for themselves. That is very surprising. As if, and I totally understand you. Uh, I mean, I totally hear you when you say, uh, like you talked about your friends who approach you in a party and now in a certain um, kind of conservative way. Uh, it, is, uh, it is unbelievable. Like the resilience of this phobia is unbelievable. It's beyond me. Why? Just see it, download it. <laughs> And it, it's just that. It automatically starts and does the job for you. So that has been the most surprising aspect, that people don't take even one basic step to see for themselves. Mesam, I'm going to take more than one basic step. I can't wait to, to walk and make money, <laughs> make money for my walking. <laughs> I will send you then some links. So, uh, and this is a network kind of based rhizomatic so to speak, I'm using uh, a, a, like a specialist expression. This is horizontal rise. And the more you uh, you connect, the more you are rewarded. It's been a great pleasure. I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for this uh, chance. Much appreciated. Bye bye. Good office. Yeah. Cheers. Good office. Mesam Behravesh, a political analyst and a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at Lund University, Sweden. He is the co-founder of the Memonat Anno crypto farm in Sweden. We reached Mesam Behravesh in Malmo, Sweden today. You're listening to Rook episode 176. This is Iranians and the metaverse. Let's get to the second part of a discussion about the new digital world and in particular NFTs. You've heard about them, you're interested or confused or eager to get in on the market. Well, let's try to do something of a primer about what these non-fungible tokens or NFTs are, how these digital ledgers could transform arts and compensation for creativity, and what the implications are for Iranians inside and outside of Iran. Are NFTs worth the money? or the hype, some experts say they're a bubble poised to pop like the dot-com craze or Cabbage Patch dolls. Others believe NFTs are here to stay and that they will change investing forever. So our second feature guest is a lawyer, business advisor, NFT enthusiast, and community builder. Alwin Tavakoli is the founder and CEO of a boutique firm based in Zurich, Tavakoli Advisory Switzerland, LLC, where she is providing tailor-made solutions and advice to international clients. Alwin is also a member of the Board of Advisors in the World Litigation Forum in Dubai. She was born and raised in a Kurd family in Tehran. She pursued her education in Switzerland, obtained a master's in law from the University of Zurich. Alwin has more than 20 years of experience working in different fields, such as sports, real estate, statistics, banking, and law. She broke out of her corporate job to pursue the entrepreneurial world in recent years, and in particular, in the last couple of years, Alwin has been focusing on NFTs and the metaverse. She is one of the first Iranian lawyers in this space and has worked on a few very high-profile NFT projects, including that of Iranian classical music star Ali Reza Qurbani. And right now, Alwin Tavakoli joins me today from Zurich, Switzerland. Hello. 
Hi, hi. Thank you so much for having me. Great introduction. Let's get blushed, but uh, great. Thank you so much. Doesn't leave me much to say. <laughs> great to be with you. Well, actually, sadly, you have a lot we need you to say because um, uh, <laughs> I need you I need you to do this primer for us, and then I'm going to ask you some technical and perhaps even philosophical questions about uh, NFTs and this digital space. So thank you for doing this. First and foremost, if we can, let's define the terms, the lexicon. What what have you come up with as the simplest explanation for what an NFT is? It is an asset, but it's not a physical asset. It is not this, but it is a digitized version of this. I mean, funny enough, I have this book about um, Rafael Santi. <laughs> you're, you're holding up a picture for those who are listening to us and not watching. You're holding up a picture and you said it's this. What, what, is, what is it you're holding? Yes, this this what I'm holding. It's actually a booklet about uh, Raphael Santi, uh, Italian Renaissance painter from Urbino, one of my favorites, actually. And um, but this what we are holding is the physical version, right? So this is like a booklet that I'm holding in my hand. It's tangible. I can touch it. I can give it to you. I can have it here. I can store it in my library, in my bookshelf. But an NFT as such, it is the digital format of this in the form of codes, in the digital code. So it's not something that you can touch, you cannot hold, you cannot put in your pocket, I cannot give it to you physically, I cannot put it here, I cannot store it anywhere, but I can store that code in my digital wallet. Hmm. A lot of people say, I don't want to hold something that I can't touch. That is a, that is a huge objection all the time. So it's basically a digital file that looks like a picture uh, that you would see on your phone, for example. Yes? Right. You can see on your phone if you open your wallet. If you have your wallet on your phone, you can have access to it. You can show it to people. And in terms of the the definition of NFT, the non fungible token the non-fungible part speaks to as i understand it how uh unlike cryptocurrencies and physical money that can be traded and exchanged nfts are digital signatures that cannot be exchanged or traded as equal to one another yes uh, they can be exchanged but they cannot be replaced ah. you know that has been a term that is being mixed up very very often also legally that can create some misunderstandings or uh, maybe misconceptions i mean you can exchange it i can exchange it with you or i can exchange it with something else but it's not the same you know it's not that asset it's not that code it is not that um let's say a uh, token it's not the same token Okay, and the and where does one uh, again start starting with the elemental questions? Where does one find an NFT if one is in the market to buy one? There are different markets actually. It is like uh, exactly also like forex. It's like uh, also physical uh, um, asset markets when you want to go and, and buy, do shopping in a, in a shopping mall, etc. You have different shops. You have for for one brand even in one city. You have different shops. You have different stores. Also the same applies for NFTs. We have different marketplaces. We can call them exactly like this, such as Foundation, such as Rarible, Maker's Place, uh, OpenSea. Um, and so on and so forth. So these few that I mentioned are really the major mm. ones. And there you can find and you can trade, you can watch, you can just, just look up and window shop or just shop. And most NFTs currently, the most popular NFTs are pieces of art or videos, right? Or, or basically just creations. Very good. I agree with the last term that you mentioned, and that is what I have been using recently. Instead of uh, NFT artists, I use NFT creators because, you know, the whole movement started with the artists, but now the whole NFT uh, doors are open to everyone. You can NFT your book, you can NFT your publication, you can NFT your um, coins, you can NFT your house, you can NFT your dress. If it is non-fungible, you can do it, yes. Wait a second, so if, <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. So if you NFT your house, uh, it means you sell your house as, as a little picture to someone? Is that what the NFT in your Sell house? the digital code of it, yes. And if somebody wants the physical as one, as well, 
then you can have an agreement. You can have an additional agreement with them. If they want the, the, or the physical one as well, then it's going to be a different, um, yes, agreement. It's a different trade. Without getting the physical, what's the value of a digital code of my house to anyone? Uh, you know, the value is that you can carry, it is like an art exhibition, that it's like a portable art exhibition. I'm still calling it art exhibition because, as you said, the majority of the assets are consisting of uh, pieces of art. Right. That uh, house, as long as it is also um, stored there as a digital code, it's representing a digital asset, you can have it stored in your wallet and that's portable, but you cannot carry the whole house with yourself. That is a different thing. So it applies the same because now you say, what is it that you cannot buy a house and you can buy a, uh, the code? Same applies for that painting that you get the digital code and probably that artist has the physical uh, version at his own as, or as uh, her own house hanging somewhere on the wall, but you do not own that one. However, in case you do not pay for the physical one, then there will be sometimes problem that the artist can still go ahead and sell the physical one and you're carrying the digital one. So a lot of those people who are purchasing a digital uh, asset, they are also interested to have the physical one as long as existent. Mm. You know, sometimes you just create a piece of digital art and the physical one is just non-existent. But as long as both are existent, then it's a matter of the agreement between the creator and the collector. Just still in the realm of um, people getting their their heads and their 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 ideas around this, is there a particular NFT that you can point to and go, um, here's an example of a successful NFT. Here's an example of something that was sold that has value. I mean, what does your where does your mind go when I ask you that, that question? Name one. Well, bored apes. CryptoPunks, I mean, these are the most prominent NFT projects. They were being traded for zero dollars or sometimes for just a couple of hundreds of dollars the past uh, few years. I remember a friend of mine who is owning two now, two CryptoPunks, he told me uh, his uh, father-in-law two years ago, he just gave him this as just uh, a gift. And he didn't know what uh, digital assets are. He didn't know what NFTs are. And those days, these punks were just being like given to one another as gifts or just on very, very minor. So this is, this is the little digital picture of the ape, right? That the famous. The uh, apes are the different ones. Crypto oh, punks okay. and the bored apes are the apes that looks really, look really bored. So these were like two. They have been and now they are also still the most um, prominent and the most profitable uh, projects of NFTs. But now that friend of mine got those two gifts. He is now um, very well set financially. Yeah. Okay, well, um, so you're a lawyer, so you're, you're on some level, you have to be used to making your case and, and the arguments. So let me push back on this. I mean, what what do you say to folks who <laughs> who still say this sounds like nonsense? I mean, selling little digital files to people, things that you can't even, even hold in your hand. Who would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for what basically amounts to a trading card? Uh, what do you say to those folks? Well, first, the first and uh, foremost that I can say is it's not about the price. It's about the value. And the price is being defined by the market. If I pay for this because I love Rafael, I pay for this maybe, I don't know, $500. Maybe you say, who is Rafael? I don't even know him. It does. I don't even pay a dime for this. So the value is what is being defined by the interest of the potential collector. Mm. And this collector are defining the market. So that is, let's say, the business part of it that we all need to really accept. I mean, this, this happens also in the physical world. You know, some pieces of arts, some people, they just roll eyes. How could someone pay amount of X or a mm -hmm. couple of hundreds of million for that work of art that is probably to someone else not art at all? So, you know, the perception of what is art, what is valuable, what is good, what is bad, it's all a matter of uh, taste and it's a matter of personal valuation. That is why we still do not have a classic or traditional or let's say, um, um, how to say, well accepted uh, model of valuation. Mm. And one last thing is that why 
why is it still tangible, although you cannot touch or hold them, is because the whole world has changed. You know, the whole world has been now running towards digitization, mm. either we want it or not. I personally, two years ago, if somebody was approaching me with this, I would have said the same, scammers, stay away. I mean, having worked as, as a compliance officer for the second Swiss major bank, I was thinking about even crypto, doesn't make sense to me at all. Don't come to me with that. I don't want to hang out with scammers. Mm. Two years ago, that was me. But you know, once you start, I learned that do not deny or reject something without having learned about it. You know, it's always good to be skeptical. It's always good to have a certain level of uncertainty mm. about stuff. That is actually the component of all of us towards growth and towards learning more. But the moment I started really getting engaged with it and I started doing some research, then I just saw, okay, this is not just some, you know, wild, wild west stuff. Yes, as long as the laws are not still there, regulations are not still there, a lot of people are calling it, oh, this is a wild, wild west. I don't want to get engaged there because there is no legal uh, mm. merits. There is no legal protection. There right. is nothing. So that would be then another thing why a lot of people in the world are still very reluctant, which makes it more profitable and more interesting for those who got engaged already because but, they are still a very minority. But, but you know what? I mean, I... I kind of get it when it comes to, I mean, I don't kind of get it. I totally get it when it comes to digital art. In other words, if I could own the, um, the non-fungible token, if I own the NFT of a, uh, of a Banksy, you know, this original piece of art that this artist that I think is amazing has created, uh, and, and that's mine and I have that forever and I've got some sort of copyright ownership of this or what I, I get it. Um, you know, when it comes to other, you, you, you talked about the house earlier. I have a friend, uh, a dear friend in, in New York, who is a very prominent designer. He's been very, very successful in his life as a, as a clothing designer. You know, he had a, a popular underwear brand and line and everything. And he says these days he's making his money through NFTs. And he designed a jacket for uh, a very um, famous person. Um, and uh, sold it for uh, a lot of money. Uh, I, I mean, well, to me, it was a lot of money. I, you know, he, he said in the clothing, uh, selling clothing designs and the NFTs is relatively new. So it was $20,000 or something like that. Um, and, and, and I said, oh, wow, well, I'd love to see it. And he, so he pulled out his phone and he showed me this, uh, this picture of a jacket like a design of a jacket and i and i was like that's great well where's where's the jacket there's no fucking jacket <laughs> the jacket doesn't exist you know it's just a picture of a jacket that he drew and that part is the part where i just can't get my head around it it's like what what is the value of that that is that is a very good thing and that's the the, the most common objection actually why can i why should i invest in something that i can't touch or I can't wear now in your case with that jacket, 20,000 for something I cannot wear. Okay, fashion industry has been now really, really getting um, into this area as well. And they are rocking it already. I mean, uh, also in the world of metaverse, why is fashion now connected to, to NFT also in such a powerful way? Because the world is moving towards a metaverse, you know, not from the universe to the metaverse. And in metaverse, we all, if we want to enter it, we need to create our own avatars. You know, this Ewan and this Jian and the physical world are not meeting here. They will have a meeting also in Metaverse. Hmm. In that world... At the Abbey concert. But yeah, yeah. For example, for example, in a concert, we suddenly bumped into each other. And of course, it would impress me to see you in that $20,000 jacket. <laughs> That jacket will be worn on your avatar. And I tell you, in a couple of years, our avatars will be better dressed than ourselves because that is how we can uh, start our meetings with other people, our dates, our encounters, our gatherings, our uh, seminars and concerts. Many things will be happening there and the world is shifting from the universe to metaverse. I mean, as a, um, let's say, outcome of COVID, now the modern school uh, kids they, will, they are not like us that a lot of parents or a lot of adult people still craving for that old mm. normal. Oh, when are we going back to the old days? For them, for those who entered school during uh, COVID times, there is no old days. There are mm. no old days or old normal or back to normal. For them, that is normal. 
And if I'm you know? wearing if I'm wearing the jacket uh, at the Abbey concert and you, oh, wow, look at your jacket. Uh, presumably nobody else could ever wear that jacket because I own the NFT, right? Right. Correct. And is it is there also value in it in the sense that uh, I could, if I own the design of the jacket, uh, maybe this is old school of me, but per, then I can take that and make those jackets in the physical world and sell them because I own the, the copyright to the design? Is that is that true? Is that what I'm getting? That's a very, very uh, legal question. And no, the copyright is not transferable with the asset, not automatically, unless it is a part of the smart contract and you pay for that. You know, for example, if you sell a song, a piece of your music, the copyright holder is still that artist. It's still the singer, Hmm. unless as a part of the smart contract, you will transfer also the copyright the intellectual property right to that collector and you say okay this piece of music has been produced by me has been sung by me but now for example with this amount of ethereum you will get the uh, you will get the, the asset you will get the token but then if you pay x ethereum or i don't know one the, the, i mean i'm just talking about ethereum i'm just yeah, just as yeah. current I'm not saying how much but if you pay x amount then you will get also the intellectual property rights transferred to you. So you can do whatever with the text of the song you you mm. wish. You can make a movie and put the song on it. You can commercialize it. You can you know uh, um, distribute it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is something else. But how you can make money? Maybe that would be something interesting also for you. If if um, you say, what can I do with that jacket? If I do not own the, the IP, you can resell it. You can resell that jacket to somebody else who thinks, oh, actually, I love old school stuff. You know, I love to to wear classic things. And then you can sell it to whatever price you want. And from that price that you earn, a certain percentage will be always automatically transferred to the creator. But, to the, but, but you're saying unless it's carved into the contract, I don't own the jacket. I just own the, the trading card. I just own the digital file of the jacket, right? So this, so my prominent designer friend, he can go and actually produce in the physical world a million of those jackets. Uh, I've just got the picture of it that I paid the $20,000 for, right? It's not the picture. It's the jacket of your avatar. Okay. It's the jacket you of know, your this, avatar. I mean, if you see it like this, then suddenly <laughs> it makes crazy sense, you know? Yes, you're laughing. A lot of people are laughing, my friend, a lot of people. But in two, three years, those who are wearing them, they will be laughing. Well, well part of the, I'll tell you why I'm laughing. Look, for, first of all, I love, if I had the, if, if my, I, I want to get my avatar together. I do want to meet oh. you at the Ebby concert. And I want, and I'd be, lo- I'd love to be wearing the $20,000 jacket. Let's meet at Depeche Mode. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I have, Depeche Mode would even be better. I, I, thank you. Um, but, but I guess part of what rubs me the wrong way is, is the, this, you know, in the conversation we were just having with Maysam about cryptocurrency, one of the things that was so exciting for him or that maybe invited all these libertarians in the beginning or even anarchists to love cryptocurrency was the notion that it's a level playing field, right? That it's, that, you know, in its purest form, anyone, anyone can play. You don't have to be a millionaire to get involved in cryptocurrency. You can have $1 and put that into cryptocurrency. It doesn't seem that way with NFTs. NFTs seem like the, they're the domain or playland of the well-to-do. It's hard to imagine a working class person wanting to spend money on this $20,000 jacket that hopefully they can prospectively wear at the Depeche Mode concert in a few years from now when their avatar will have it on. Is this an accessible field or the equivalent of another really high-priced art gallery that only a select few can enter? Well, that is a very good question, actually, because the great thing about NFTs is that it's not uh, limited to, let's say, the rich and the wealthy. It is not. It actually, the whole movement got started to remove that perception of the starving artist, you know, because unfortunately in the world, people think, hmm, art cannot make you money. I mean, it's a perception. I don't say that it's true because we have a lot of great financially wealthy artists and it's great that they are. I mean, look at, you know, some rock stars, some really high profile painters. I mean, this is not actually about um being poor as an artist. So it means art can make you a lot of money. However, 
We have also like albums, like I mean, in the old times, like CDs, or now afterwards, now in the in the uh, let's say the whole music industry changed towards now uh, different formats of distributing music and distributing art, so that you're not limited to a, one album if you want to have access to one favorite song of an artist. So that first part of that, let's say, pre-foundation of today's uh, world in NFTs, it was set by let's say having the choice of uh, getting a single piece of, of a of a song uh, because you wanted only that one and then you mm. pay for that mm. download it and have it but still that artist has millions of that one single song and I can own it as well and you can own it and each one of us pay the price for listening to it and to owning it mm. although we could have listened to it also on some let's say free of charge platforms but it's a different way when you have it on your cell phone when you can use it offline you know we know what we're paying for mm. similar applies also for nfts for a lot of people they say oh my god how is it i can also take a picture with that car or with that house or even with that piece of nft as as a, maybe a pdf file or maybe as a jpeg why should it be of value if I just can take a screenshot of it or I just can copy paste it? It is exactly like as a tourist that you take a picture in front of the Louvre Museum, but you cannot trade that museum. You cannot rent it. You cannot sell it. Mm. You cannot buy it just like that. So it means about that legal ownership or that certificate of authentication that you receive by getting paying for that piece of digital token. Now, to your um, main part of the question that um, was about um, what was that? Wh why you pay for that? My qu my question was about the inequity of it. In other words, who who can really afford these things? Yeah. Uh, oh, exactly, exactly. About the exclusivity and if it's only for the rich, etc. Sorry, um, we have different platforms. We have charges of arts. We have different, uh, let's say, artists. We have like artists that they have been producing their, their art or they have been like uh, minting their art. That's the process of registering that digital asset or that token that's called minting for even for free or for just, I don't know, for $20, for $10, mm -hmm. for something like that. So nowadays it has been uh, arriving to that stage that is about affordability and accessibility as well. Yes, maybe that project or that token that you have uh, purchased for $10 last year, maybe now it's worth tens of thousands of dollars. So that is how the value will change and transform um, by the growth of a project or by uh, the fall of a project. There if, have been some if NFTs don't go bust, I mean, the fact that you you used CDs as, as an example a, a, a little a few moments ago is 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 I'm glad you did because. Um, I'm one of those people, maybe like you, who's a kid of the 90s, who has a 2,000 CDs sitting in my basement that are no good to anyone. No one will buy those for me for nothing, right? I mean, they basically go into the garbage. So the fear is that NFTs become the next CD. I tell you something. It's always It always depends on how you present them and how you promote what you have. I still have, not even in my cellar, just here, I still have hundreds of CDs here. <laughs> and actually they are like a part of uh, artistic side of my uh, apartment. When I have people visiting, they are just being amazed by most of those, let's say master CDs of, I don't know, the first album of the Sand Anger of Metallica. These are non <laughs> I even have the master cassettes. Yeah. Try, try selling sure. them somewhere. No, no one's gonna buy them off you. <laughs> there were some people who were interested in paying me a fortune to get that collection. Sure, and I never sure. collected those with the intention of selling them or talking about collections, my stamp albums, you know, one great thing about one great example about uh, NFTs is also about the collection of stamps. You know, I, I used to collect them as I was a minor. I mean, five year old, 10 year old, I was collecting and I have a couple of albums. And those days I didn't know what a precious asset I'm putting together. So, you know, the value can be really defined by time, by the market. And it's very, very individual. You and, know? and look, let me just say, I'm, I'm, I'm partly uh, playing devil's advocate. I'm, and this is healthy skepticism, I would like to say, with, with, with the proviso that honestly, I do on some level really want NFTs to succeed. I mean, I, 
your case that this is a, a boon to artists, to creators, that this opens up a new avenue of a compensation, of remuneration, of, of, of recognition for artists, I think is, is amazing. That, that, that part of it, I really want it to work. Um, but with that said, I mean, let me ask you a like a, 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 a rook question. You know, I mean, you're, you're, if you have a friend right now in Zurich who is a poet and works during the day as a barista, and she spends, you know, um, uh, half of her income on her rent and is just getting by, um, would you really say, hey, I think you should spend your money on NFTs right now? Uh, honestly, that would be financial advice, and I just try to to avoid uh, giving financial or legal advice here <laughs> to anyone. So please uh, consider my disclaimer. But I would introduce that friend to this world without telling him or her do it. I would say, why why won't you look at it? Or I am doing it. Why won't you look at it? It's exactly like somebody is coming to you and say, hey, real estate market is booming. Come on. You are my friend. I think I want you to win as well. I'm going to invest in this. Do you want to join me? So go, but do your own due diligence. That has been always my slogan throughout my business life, legal life. When I do trainings and presentations to everyone, I say whatever I'm giving you for information and education, yes, must be super valuable to you. But before applying them, do your own due diligence. Okay, I know? think that's I think that's very fair. Let me ask you a couple of questions before I let you go, because uh, I, I know you're busy. This it occurs to me um, that NFTs, both the beauty of them and, and a potential difficulty, is that they cut out the middle person, right? So if an artist is traditionally selling their work of art in an art gallery, there's usually an agent involved. There's the gallery owner. There's all kinds of middle people that. It occurs to me you could cut out with the NFT uh, and go directly to a, the market and sell as an artist. But with that said, you'd have to be educated on the business and and kind of business savvy to be able to do this in a, in in a proficient way. Does that provide some kind of challenge? It does. It is actually a huge challenge. It's one of the greatest challenge of the majority of artists, actually. And I, I still try not to use the term artist. I mean, the creators, because most of those people who are bringing their work, their creation, their uh, non fungible token uh, to these platforms, they don't know how to promote it. They don't know how to talk about it. They don't know. I mean, you're a great copywriter. You just you just um, told me that. And if you are not good in, for example, copywriting, in putting those few lines together mm. about the story of that creation, about the story of that token, what was the background? What brought you create that? You know, it is half or even 70% of that NFT. Mm -hmm. You know, I always tell them 30% is, is your work, 70% is how you present it and promote it. That is it. You know, you can have the best piece of artwork also in the physical world. But as long as you don't know how to promote it and present it, it can stay the best kept secret in the world forever, although it might be hundreds of millions of dollars. So the lack of business acumen has been now throughout the past, I wouldn't say years, because the whole, really the whole trend and the whole movement has got started like a bit more than a year ago. So that has been a a huge challenge for a lot of artists and creators how to position their work how to package it i always use this five p's of mine uh, packaging promoting pricing uh, pitching and presenting mm. these are some things that is, if they don't know it then let's say 70 percent of their efforts are, are gone there are a lot of artists that they have made fortune ever since they entered the world of NFT. And there are a lot that they are just watching those others say, oh my God, how how did they do it? Right. And as you said, yes, the whole NFT philosophy was to cut off those, those middle person and to give like 100% of that income to the artist, plus the royalties that they are getting from the reselling of that work, as I said, just in between our, our discussions you have also the possibility to resell what you have purchased one. And this can be done like numerous times for unlimited times. And as long as this reselling or this secondary market is going, that initial or that first creator or that artist will be receiving automatically through the blockchain platform 
uh, that percentage of that royalty. That mm. is why it has been, let's say, assuring the artists a kind of financial uh, welfare that they must have reserved throughout the course of history. Now, cutting off those people, those middle persons, it is beneficial, of course, to the artists. And at the same time, if they do not own that business acumen, it can be as self, I mean, it can be suicide for them. Right. Unless they start learning and getting educated about business acumen, about selling, about negotiating, about talking about their work, most of the artists are pretty shy or they're too humble to talk about their work and say, this is my work, this is what mm. it's about. And a lot of them are still not good at public speaking. Mm. You know, it's, it's not only amongst artists, it's like 99% of the world are afraid of public speaking. The fear of pu public speaking is even uh, greater than the fear of death. So it means the people, <laughs> the people prefer to be the one in the box mm. than the person who is talking about the dead person, you know? So that is a, that is a, huge challenge but uh, people like me like a lot of people who have been in the world of business they are now trying to somehow fill in those gaps to help to advise to do consulting to even sometimes coach those creators throughout this path what is pr for example the better way for you to present your work what project shall you first present to the market uh, how shall you talk about it mm. or whether you talk about it or not or i help you do it so the whole trend is now also creating different uh, ways of collaborations or opportunities as well for those people to get to a point to work with each other if they cannot do it alone. It is such a, a, a great pleasure to get to talk to you about all this and to, to learn from you on it. Let me ask you a final question. I, we spent a fair bit of time with May Sam talking about uh, the implications of the, the metaverse and, and cryptocurrency for uh, Iranians and the diaspora for Iran. Um, let me ask you, what, what do you see the implications of NFTs for artists, for designers, for creators, as we've said, um, in a closed society like Iran and for Iranians around the world? That is a great question. And I would say rather for the artists around the world, but specifically about Iranian, I mean, this has given them these opportunities to reconnect to the world. You know, for a lot of Iranian artists, they had a challenge, not only now because of the situation in our country, but also financially, for example, or due to the lack of network, for example, that if they did not know a prominent gallerist in London, for example, they could never get a chance to have their paintings exhibited somewhere in a London um, um, painting exhibition or in San Francisco or in Paris or something. So one part is the financial issue. One part is the network and the relationship issues. And one part is finding that right advisor in between to get their work up there and on the other hand you know sanctions everything they have been creating also restrictions not to get the artwork out there i know a friend of mine who was a gallerist in london and she tried actually to bring out the work of an iranian artist just for an exhibition not and, and then afterwards to return but then the whole uh, stuff were got uh, like suspended in Turkey in the airport because of some regulations, etc. And then they suffered a lot of, I mean, huge losses and crazy disappointment and discouragement. So this is now NFT is that you do not have to physically carry something. You do not have to pass any border. Mm -hmm. This is heaven. I mean, for artists, I, I'm a lawyer by profession, but an artist by heart. That's why I mm -hmm. have always that excitement and that feeling when, when other creators and artists are talking about this way of freedom and then having access to the rest of the world uh, as well. And maybe just in parentheses as well, I have created also my own NFTs. I have been engaged also in some collaboration with some great projects as well, and some cool ones are coming, so stay tuned. It is not only the lawyer or the business advisor talking mm -hmm. here, it's also the uh, semi-artist uh, with a lot of passion and a lot of potential within herself that is now getting connected also to this world. Mm. And now seeing also people with that derive and those potentials in Iran. I mean, we have artists, they're gems, they're like gemstones there, but they could not be introduced to the world. And now the world is getting to learn about them, to know about them, to get introduced to them. And they are making money. That is that is amazing. I, I said that that was the la uh, that was going to be the last question. I, I lied. I actually have a supplemental to that. But, uh, no, <laughs> no I, I mean, it's it just occurs to me because 
so much of this depends on um, the recognition, and, and you're the right person to ask about this as, as somebody who's dealing on the legal side with some of this stuff. So so much of this depends on the global recognition of these currencies, of these, of these new um, platforms, of these new things. Uh, and so um, how do you deal with a, a country, Halad, we don't have to say Iran, any, I mean, any, any nation in the world could do this, that, that might come out and say, we don't recognize NFTs. We don't recognize the copyright. We don't recognize the value of an NFT. You know, this is now a very, very interesting question. And I'm so, so happy that you lied, actually, uh, because this goes back to the whole concept of decentralization. You know, the blockchain is based on the philosophy of decentralization. So it means there is no authority. There is no, let's say, big brother watching you and regulating you. And the whole values and the whole, let's say, frameworks are somehow non-written community laws. Mm. As a lawyer, getting excited about that, it's not natural, it's not normal because, yeah, I told you I'm not a, let's say, a, a traditional lawyer. So I have a super, let's say, rebellion uh, characters. Mm -hmm. And that is why I could associate with that a lot. But it doesn't mean that I do not respect or accept laws. That is what I practice, actually. But I always say there must be a nexus or there must be a connection between law and logic. Mm. If logic is making more sense, then that law is obsolete that law is outdated, that must go out, and you should not obey it only because it's written. What does your logic is saying? What is the common sense is saying? And that part of common sense, it is something that have been already ruling uh, NFTs, not only NFTs, but the whole blockchain, the mm -hmm. whole, let's say, cryptocurrency area, because they're all based on decentralization. They don't want somebody to look at them, they don't want somebody to control them. That is the exciting part, but, you know, the lawyers always have a law and then have an exception. So the exception part, that's the risky part. And that is wh how, uh, why people like us or like myself get engaged and say, now it's a place also for us to serve and to uh, protect the community from, let's say, fraudulent behaviors, criminal actions, um, you know, uh, um, damages, losses, copyright issues, uh, stealing of works, copying of works, uh, you know, illegitimate minting of artworks that they do not belong to you, uh, wallet hackings. Oh, a lot of things has been happening for a lot of people who are engaged in the NFT world as collector or as creators. 90% of them, they have seen only the cool sites but there are 10% that who have been suffering from uh, legal and compliance issues as well, that their work have been stolen, mm. the copyright has been infringed, um, the intellectual property was you know, copied without their consent, collaborative uh, uh, artworks were sold without uh, paying that uh, different uh, artists who have been uh, co contributing to that creation, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the part of the risk that depends on the risk appetite of the person who is getting engaged and say, okay, I'm getting into this, but I accept that there is a certain percentage of risk of X, Y, Z legal and compliance issues. The laws are being made, probably are being written. You know, the legal industry has been always behind the technology and innovation. A lawyer is saying this totally confession, no problem. But exactly that is why I said people like us got engaged and say, we still have no NFT laws, we still have no NFT court or NFT dispute resolution chamber. If you take a, a claim or a problem to a court of law, you need to first educate the judge what is non-fungible right. token, what right. is it token at all. So it is a wild, wild west as such. It is a, a world based on anonymity. This is decentralized. At the same time, the whole community based non-written laws and ethics business ethics, trade ethics, it has become like the old times, that has created the accountability, mm. the accountability versus the anonymity so that you can stay anonymous because your wallet can be just a series of numbers and digits and, and uh, letters. But at the same time, you don't want to risk your credibility, your reputation and your position in the community by messing up uh, with uh, fraudulent or criminal behaviors, you know. So there are these this conflicts of interest all the time. You don't want to lose your reputation, so you behave. Because you lose your reputation, you lose your position in the community. The community throw you out, your career in NFT is over. 
Awin Tavakoli, this has been uh, great. I really appreciate it. I hope you'll come back and 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 do more and and come back and t- talk about your own uh, fascinating journey uh, at some point as well. Thank you so so much for having me. It was a great pleasure. And actually, the time passed by like this, as you told me. We spent a little bit of time. I just looked and said, "Oh wow, okay, <laughs> he's right." <laughs> but that is how a great conversation and great company is about. Merci and chodafes. Chodafes. Thank you. Awin Tavakoli, a lawyer, business advisor, NFT enthusiast, as you could hear, and community builder. She is one of the first Iranian lawyers in this space and has worked on a few very high-profile NFT projects, including that of Iranian classical music star Ali Reza Qurbani. Awin Tavakoli joined us from Zurich, Switzerland today. Right, microphone's back on for Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, and the fabulous Keon. Iranians and the metaverse. Let's get to a little roundtable on this. Now we've listened in to Mesam Behravesh in uh, Sweden and uh, Awin Tavakoli, who is just joining me from Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Um, both of them are very compelling people. I mean, uh, May Sam sell on cryptocurrency at the end. Just yeah. try it. Just try yeah. it. I was like, oh, let's quit the show right now and <laughs> go and get some, download some apps. Uh, so, Keon, did that, did either of these conversations change your, make you more enthusiastic about getting involved in this stuff? For Bitcoin, for sure. I want to, I need to do my own due, digital, due diligence and uh, study about it and figure out, you know, more details before I actually put in money. NFT, <laughs> listen, for me, I like the real world, okay? Mm. I don't understand why there's this push to enter the metaverse and, you know, all this, like, to me, it's just... I, if I can't hold it in my hand, it's not real. I feel like this world is already some, in some way, a metaverse. You know, like our souls are here, and, mm. and I'm before mm. getting mm. really into good, that. Good, good, so, good. so why she why doesn't why smoke go? just before the opera? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So why? Why it's nice. like it's like that movie where they enter a dream into a dream, and uh, you know the movie Inception. Like Inception. Inception oh, yeah. yeah. Why? Why go? Why take it further into you know? I don't know. It's uh, just getting uh, a little weird for me. So I, I, I NFTs. You would not, I'm not buy convinced. an NFT. No, you would fuck not. No. <laughs> you would not buy. I'm not the, convinced with the, NFTs. The, the, jacket i was talking no. about the um, <laughs> sound like, uh, yeah and I'll reza okay here's my two cents i think what are we talking about crypto or nft both actually right, let right, me right. let me explain for me uh, it was i'm actually the opposite of keon like I, the nft i have no problem investing in what? i can buy an nft explain right yourself. now i'll tell you why because to me this is my takeaway from both these conversations all right first uh, first currency uh, first nft f- to me is just art like art in the digital world that's it that which part of it is confusing now th- and that's subjective if i'm an artist and a cuckoo one i'd be like this jacket is a piece of art and i want to sell it to you like sell a photo of it just attach a code to it this code exists in the world and there's only one of it doesn't exist uh, no more and that's it that's art like i would buy it but it's not is it so when but she was talking the about the house thing. but that you see, can that buy the, the, the nft of a house that, that's that, not that, art that's ridiculous okay, like that's just cuckoo like that's just not you can do that now too but you that's can the take point a photo. of an nft it's, it's but here's art the thing but you don't have metaverse. to buy it like right like for example like I, a photo nft of your house is just like it's ludicrous it's like you taking a photo of your house be like or t- or painting your house paint your mm-hmm. house and be like i want to sell it yes may, somebody may buy it but how much is it going to be worth right to me is that like a house is just is a house like it exists but let's say a painting or music or things that are like or even something that is a, a digital like a, um, a laser show let's say that is just one of like a, something that exists a, a piece of art that can be that is not a house. That is not a car, right? Mm-hmm. That I understand. That's so. That value so the can Ali go Reza up Horbani, and down. Yeah. The NFT of of a song. Yeah, that is valuable is because that, of Ali Reza Horbani. So the way I look at it, the way I look at it, I'm like, okay, let's say Johnny. The the the, the example that uh, um, like let's say a lot of people like talking about. Like they're like, okay, well NFT. Like what if like Johnny Depp is going through his like ups and downs of his trials? If like let's say NFT, well, he had an NFT right now, it would be worth worthless. 
Yeah, and if he had his Pirates of the Caribbean memorabilia are the same thing. Because it's him that gives the piece of art value, not the NFT itself. That's just a new form of art. But but people have trouble figuring out why a mm-hmm. um, the twenty thousand dollar picture of a jacket. Yeah, you're saying because that's art. The twenty thousand. That's not. That wasn't Aween's argument. Was because that's going to have status. Not only not in the in the far future, in the near future, we're going to be avatars. Gonna, we're going to be in a, in a metaverse. We're going to mm-hmm. be at a concert, and you'll be wearing that cool jacket, and that'll be the kind of status that you would get today from wearing your Gucci jacket or driving your Benz. But right? that's the same thing, right? With anything else, like well, that's can, not an argument that it's art. That's an argument that you're you're investing in. You're things. investing in something, but what I'm saying is that don't like get confused and lose track of what it actually is just because NFT, like the word NFT, is attached to it. For example. Let me give you another example. Um, uh, uh, These examples no, are getting no, more no, confusing. No, <laughs> maybe, maybe try one that works. Yeah. yeah. All right. uh, so there's a try with if, uh, John, is, Johnny Depp, and if he yeah, had an NFT, uh, what? Yeah. What about Tom Brady? Right. He, he announced that he was going to uh, retire from NFL. Yeah, exactly. His jersey was sold for what eight million dollars, whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then he said that he's going to come back and play, and that jersey became worthless. Oh, simple as that. That's NFT for you, man. It's the same thing. What, so it's what, becoming what? worthless. Is what, what you're saying? Your point Which, is that the. What do you mean? That's an what NFT. I'm saying is that it doesn't matter that it's an NFT. That memora- piece of memorabilia uh-huh. was worth eight million dollars today, uh-huh. but tomorrow. Did Tom, Tom Brady, Brady was Tom said Brady's I'm not gonna, shirt I'm gonna, an gonna, NFT? Oh my God, which part of it don't you understand? I'm like, dude, NFT. Does anyone understand what And a real thing are the same thing. Which part of it don't you No, they're not. Really, but they're really not. Digital, That's the, the point is they they're not. Are. It's just, no, because you can wear the Tom oh Brady jersey. Yeah. But and you, you can hang it in your room. Good. Yeah, you can hang it in your you, room. You'd have to hang your phone with a digital photo of the of, of the Tom Brady NFT. I mean, that's that's oh what God. I'm just. That's what you guys worried about, that you don't have it actually can Yes, that was Keon's point. You can only. Can you touch your email address? Address, your it's email only, address no, is on, one and on. only attached it's only, to you. It's only recognized and appreciated once you enter the metaverse. I have no interest in entering that Don't space. enter the metaverse. Maybe, How about this? Uh, who, is, who, uh, who is your favorite um, person in oh the boy, world the mo- that you would I, die to have to, that you would die to have their email address just I, their email address nobody I, I okay like i have that <laughs> okay right. good for you you're you don't martin scorsese yeah. no not martin scorsese right. for me it's like james dean right, right. if i james have, dean is dead yes okay. is, is my right. idol right? right if i could have his handwritten like his his um, signature yes right a photo of his signature yes i'd be i'd pay a lot of money for that right Okay, and that's that, memorabilia. Yeah. It's a, but it, is it, it the same thing? It can be NFT. Memorabilia can okay. be NFT. Yes, it Piece can. Piece of art can be NFT. Yes, it can. But anything but, but that it, you. Can but that's think. not what. But but that's not. That I mean, is that what that? Th- is. I don't know if that's the stuff it's that people not, are tripping up on. I agree with what you. People are I would on. buy an NFT of Bowie's, you know, yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah, that yeah. he created because he's my idol. But mm-hmm. that that seems like a different argument from an NFT of a house. That you know you don't own the house, but you got the what image of it. What they're trying to do by saying they're not saying that oh that definitely is going to exist and is one of the products or byproduct of this. What what they're the, it's a bad example. And if they have a house, is just a bad example. Okay. What about crypto? Crypto. Crypto. What to about me, the is conversation with May Sam? Is you, another form of currency. That's all it is. It's like an, you invented a new form of currency. Right. It goes ups and downs. And is Russell yelling or am I? <laughs> yeah, no, he's no, a little no, angry no, today. Yeah, he's all <laughs> popped up. No, yeah. No, yeah. No, no, <laughs> Cocaine, bro? What's going no. on? <laughs> In the, before breakfast. <laughs> All right. Shia, let's uh, bring some yeah, uh, reasonable some clarity. Yeah, into yeah, bring this some clarity. Okay. Well, how did you feel about the conversations with May Sam and Aween? Um, what did they inspire in you? Yeah, uh, I want to say something about the previous conversation that you just had. Um, I think. Um, uh, we, without metaverse nft doesn't mean at all mm. you know so you have to imagine that f- even the house the picture of house mm. it's like that you buy the house house in another world that's right not yes. in this world yes. so yeah. it's a it's a decision that you i, I yes. mean for for me that as a person who like uh, De- deactivate my Instagram, even my Instagram. Yes. So I, 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 I don't feel too. You play. You literally play stuff on an old stereo in your of hot house. You know, of you know, course, the yeah. most digital guy. But uh, uh, but, but, but uh, yeah. having said that, I'm thinking to release my songs through NFT. There you no. go. 
<laughs> why not? He's an artist, and no, why I know. it's another. Form Nobody of wants to buy it, but everybody wants to create it. That's <laughs> yeah. what's but part of part of what uh, I think part of what it ultimately comes down to, as as Keon sort of intimated by saying, "I'm not interested in the metaverse." It's it's whether you believe this is this is the part of it where it's playing the odds, right? Mm. Both with crypto and with NFTs. It's whether you believe our world is going to be the metaverse mm-hmm. in, a, in a few years and whether you believe that's in five years from now or whether that's 50 years from now, right? Yeah. Because it does seem inevitable that that's yeah. where things are headed, yeah. right? There's Justin Bieber, as I said in the conversation with uh, I guess Maysam or somebody, Justin Bieber's already done a concert mm-hmm. in the metaverse. Like mm-hmm. the, there's gonna, those things are going to exist yeah. and they're gonna grow and so that yes, that jacket that you wear to the concert in the metaverse mm-hmm. is going to be worth a lot uh, more than it is if you're not if the metaverse doesn't exist or if you're not buying into that. So it's kind of it's kind of whether when you believe that's going to happen yeah. and how important mm-hmm. it's going to be to you. Yeah. But don't you guys think it's just uh, it's like saying art? Like no, me, no, no. no. <laughs> like it's, no. it's, it's, me, it's a it's different. Like, like, pick well, and I think choose. that's like, reductive, think, Reza. No, but yeah. I, once you say that, you kind of lose the argument the because it's too, art. it's too reductive. But because I, as okay. shy as we're it's, talking about a whole new world, it's right? like opening an Instagram account or no opening. I mean, going to metaverse or no. If you go to metaverse, no, then no, you probably need my, art. My, my to point is, I'm saying something. I'm saying more generally. Like, don't you think like it's subjective? Like there are NFTs that you can actually buy like it's tangible too mm. right like yes. you can buy so like uh, you buy you said you buy an nft bowie right so there are i think pieces of nft that is good to buy and uh, just like art that's that's why i said it's like art in a sense that there are a lot of crappy arts that is worthless but you wouldn't buy it i wouldn't pay for I'm it i'm more so that's listen, how i, I thought it. i we did an amazing job yeah. of explaining all this I, I, but i'm more sold in the immediate on mm. cryptocurrency, you mm. know, being something that I can see is going to be an NFT. is going to be a, a universal, especially because entire countries are accepting it now. Mm-hmm. Like we're talking about El Salvador, China, whatever. This is this is these are currencies. Mm. Then yeah, NFTs. I'm still not. I still don't quite get whether that's a whether it's going the way of the CD or not, you know, yeah. whether it's a thing of the moment. See, yeah. here's how I look. Crypto is useful in this world that we're in right now. NFT, I see no worth in like in this space. You have to enter another space for it to have any meaning or worth. That's mm, that's just how I yeah. look at it. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. And also the things we tie uh, worth to, you know, like it's like, how do you even put a price on stuff? Like Subjective. so ridiculous. In my but there opinion. is a there. I mean, you uh, we talked about earlier like you work in finances. Mm-hmm. There is an element of me that the element of me. There is a side of me that uh, and, and an element of this that makes me feel like uh, we're all stupid to not be jumping into crypto right now. That it's the future, and that buying get buying in now is sure, you know that, that's a possibility. That, yeah. and, and and as I said in our conversation, it it seemed sort of dodgy and speculative until I started seeing major corporations, you know, mm. working in this space. Like you know, once once Disney and Nike are in there, you're kind of like okay, clearly there's money to be made. Yeah, and uh, you know the people left behind are going to be the people left behind. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, so, and that's why I'm going to take time and actually investigate this because that's part of it too. Even yeah. if you're all, mm-hmm. even if you get enthusiastic mm-hmm. about crypto, yeah, yeah. where, which one, what right. do I invest you, you in? How do I know the right? Yeah, it takes time. well, it's but, and, but and, time and, is money. And, it's time you know. and it's a guessing game too. Yeah, There's yeah. no sure bets, right? I guess the takeaway is, is learn more about it, and that's it. That's where it's headed, anyways. And that's what we tried to do today. I would, right I would episode. lovingly, gladly just go back to the 90s without cell phones, without the internet. Really? I yes, wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. miss those Friends days. episodes, it's, new yeah, Friends episodes, it's Seinfeld getting, episodes. It's getting confusing. Do I don't like the direction of this world. Let me just put that out there. Like, I don't know if I would bring kids into this world. It's really, getting huh? a little, It's getting a little concerning. I feel the same way. I'm, I always, I, 
often ask that question of yeah. myself. Do, do, would you be happy if the internet never existed? Oh, amazing mm. life. Are you kidding me? But it's created so many good things too, right? And connection, the, no, the global connectivity. It's, so I, it's everything lost. I have is because of the internet. I, I was able to Well, that's things, exactly yeah. my point. That's, yeah. a, that's why it's a disaster. What is it that you have? This is that's a what? long show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> John John, we got to wrap it up. Uh, uh, let's go. Let's go. Letters of the week. Uh. Opera. No one Let's wants cut. to hear this. <laughs> yeah. Why? How is it he's that gonna, he's going to make an I NFT to of this? I've created a program where I this is like what's two years in. I have Reza yelling. Yourself. Try screaming. new things. See if it works. It yeah. doesn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm honestly at times surprised our audience is still growing. <laughs> Somebody tunes in and hears that. Yes, key on right. Letters of the week. What do we got? So, like you mentioned last week, we had the great Ali Reza Orbani on the show. The what do you even call him? The velvet voice. The like, wait, how do you put a word on that? Angelic Beautiful voice. voice. Anyway, so a lot of people wrote about that episode. We have Hossein Abul Ghassem wrote, "Congrats on the second anniversary of your very successful podcast." Your choice of guest, Ali Reza Orbani, was an excellent one in introducing this prominent vocal artist to a wider range of the population. Nice. Thank you, Hossein. Very nice. And then Ziba Zadeh wrote, This was one of your really good interviews. Loved it. That's the Tundar Nakone. Don't let your hands hurt. That's, that's, yeah. that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's for those, those that things. don't speak Persian. <laughs> uh, very professional. It was really nice to hear and lor- learn more about Mr. Gorbani and his path. And congrats on the second anniversary of your podcast series. Thank you, Ziba Zadeh. Mm-hmm. If I were, uh, if I could do it all again and go into the movies, I would want my name to be Ziba Zadeh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great name. That's, that's a great cool, name. That's right. a cool yeah, stage it's name. a really good name. Okay, Ziba Zadeh, if you're still looking for a new career, I mean, uh, Hollywood might be the way to go. <laughs> Bob, uh, Sammy Bayot wrote, I enjoyed the interview. Right until your, in quote unquote, distinguished guest oh. said Mr. Shajarian, as opposed to Ostad Shajarian. I'm not being picky with words, but Mr. Korbani brushed off Gian's question. Uh, uh, yeah. Simply calling Ostad Shajarian an artist. Wow, Mr. Gorbani, we hope you keep your concerts limited to Iran. I regret attending your concert a few years ago in Toronto. A true artist doesn't speak about a legend in traditional music in this nonchalant way. Truly shame on him. His words and tone really showed his character. Despite his good English, he is truly without the character of what one would expect. Therefore, people like Ostad Shajarian will forever remain in our hearts and the likes of Mr. Gorbani can go on and sell NFTs and not represent the Iranian people's hearts and souls. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, you know, uh, let me just explain that to people who, are, who are, uh, don't understand Persian or, or, or wondering what's going on there. So Ostad means master or maestro. Yes. Uh, so this, um, so Sami here is objecting to the fact that uh, um, Ali Reza Qurbani, uh, I, I guess with intention, called him Mr. Shajarian mm-hmm. as, as opposed to Ostad Shajarian. Uh, I don't know if it's with intention or not. No. Um, but I, it, would it be... Is it, do you normally have to say Ostad Shajarian or Maestro? You don't have to. You can say Ostad Shajarian, you can say Aghai Shajarian, you can say Shajarian. <laughs> but you know, that this wasn't the only... Somebody else told me this yeah. too. Said that, 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 that they had noticed that... Like at uh, all times you got to refer to them? I don't know. But I, think I guess with Ali Reza Gorbani, yeah, you you're expecting yeah. him to the be like, respect. Oh, I my think, great, I you think know. This gentleman is probably a huge fan of it's a lady. Shajarian. Clearly. And his, yeah. yeah, like yeah. and he's getting a little yeah, emotional. Yeah, I, I, that's the reason I quit social media actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's no, because really? of, of Sammy Bayat. No, no the no, like the irrational, guy. angry com- argument, mm. which I I, I, fa- I, I think it's. You think ir- that's uh, that argument is irrational? Irrational. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. But if Shaya thinks it's irrational, then I gotta. No, so I Shia, love us. I don't young, think it's. I don't think it's a. I, I think it's fair to say. It's I not w- fair to say shame 
من علی رضا قربانی ان پلیز کیپ یور کنسرت لیمیتد ان ایران دت یا نو دت آی ریگرت یور بینگ اوکی اوکی آی کرس دی دی یو ور بورن جیسوس کرایست یا اوکی اف دی بت اف دی لیتر هاد بین ریتن ابوت رضا وی ود تیک ایت فیر رایت وی ود Keep your limited to Iran. Keep your activities limited. <laughs> That'd be letter of the week. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop coming into our. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let me just think. His, you know, Reza Shola. His words and tone really showed his character. <laughs> He is true without the character of what one would expect. I know where you live, Sammy. <laughs> I know where you live. Okay. So uh, next up, we have Bita, who says. Magical voice and interview. <sighs> that's it. Thank you. Uh, oh, that's uh, Ali Reza's like, voice. Yeah. <laughs> 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 She means no, Ali, Ali like, Reza's voice. Sweet yeah. and short, you know. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, and then username me for shop wrote. <laughs> I don't know why. Me for me shop. Me, me hmm. for oh me for me shop. Yeah, I, I'm assuming it's a boutique or something. Anyway, um, wrote. I'm so sorry that we missed his performance in the U.S. due to visa issues. He's the best. Yeah, that was he was kept out of California because of the weird American laws right now. Yeah. He was served in the army, so. Yeah, um, and then Yahya Khairkha wrote saying, "Best singer ever." Mm. Mm-hmm. And then we have uh, Hani Aryan wrote, 2.9 million streams, incredible and not surprising. Proud of you guys. Thank you for the brilliant work you do for our community. And nice. uh, that's because of our second anniversary yes. Yes. last week. Yeah. Yes. I love that you keep that alive. I like it. My father's like it. saying. I, like it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Farhang. Sir Farhang. Yes. Ostad Farhang. Ostad Farhang. Sorry, Don't call him Mr. Farhang. Sorry, Jean Jean. Sorry. Tor khoda bia screening in film badim. All right. Time for letter of the week. <laughs> Uh, so the letter of the week is uh, related to the uh, contemporary history of Iran episode on Khomeiniism mm. with Dr. Ervan Ab- Abrahamian. I don't know why that's so hard for me to pronounce. It is a hard one, and it's all Oz. Abrahamian. 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 Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yes. I didn't know either, though. Yeah. And uh, apparently Yervan. Yervon. Yerv- Yervon. Oh, Yervon. Oh. It's all odd. That's right. Yervon Abrahamian. Yervon. Yervon? Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, so, letter of the week goes to Negsep. And uh, she or he, I believe it's a she, but she says, I never thought Khomeini has ever been charismatic, in uh, quotation marks. <laughs> As Gian mentioned, he always looked like an angry old man. <laughs> <laughs> That's the letter. Yeah, huh? That's the letter. Sorry, you know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Now, does this letter writer has... think, that, are they talking about Mr. Khomeini <laughs> or Ustad <laughs> <or laughs> Khomeini? <laughs> 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 I think you, you can say you can call him <laughs> <them> Mr. <laughs> or Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah. <laughs> Ayatollah. <laughs> the That's audacity right. not to give his proper title you know to be fair i did say he was he looked like an angry old man but yeah. uh but i do understand abraham Yan's, uh, dr abraham Yan's point too that <laughs> uh, first of all his description of that of, of the charisma was amazing mm. in that mm. episode but also um sometimes we're in denial that uh you know because because of our feelings about khomeini mm. that he had the power to move a lot of people Mm-hmm. There, there's certainly, you know, his words, his presence clearly. Yeah. Uh, Look at Hitler. Inspired I mean, there's millions. There's been plenty of those characters. Mm-hmm. You know which street. Hollywood actor would, can play Khomeini? Who? Sean, Sean Connery. Connery. Jeremy Irons. Sh- I think. Sean Connery. Sean Connery. He's, Looks just he's, like. Isn't him. He Look dead? it up. Isn't I feel Connery? bad, but I think Sean Connery Sean might have died. Dead pal. He, di- he, pa- he died now. Rest in peace. So did Khomeini. But yeah. <laughs> What's up with you today? My idol, James Dean. I want to get an NFT of James Dean. Uh, James Dean's been dead for 40 years. I know. Years, I right? like all the dead actors. Uh, all right. <laughs> Because new things suck. Uh, go, go, go. Except for the metaverse and <laughs> NFTs, right? <laughs> go get us some cryptocurrency. All right. Go it. find find Be the one that. Go you're good it. at these things. I go am, find the one better. where we can, you know, Keanu and I can make well, a fast buck. Yeah. Here's the thing we should do what Shia is doing. He's creating an NFT. We should create a rook NFT. Why yeah. are we going to buy NFT? Let's sell it. Everybody's selling it. <laughs> yeah. How do you even. Uh, uh, here's the thing. How do you even create an NFT? Like, <laughs> I don't know. How do you buy an NFT? Hey, do you have to li- like get licensing <laughs> or something? Or? See, you, you have all your Nazar, but you. When it comes down to the mechanics, hey, you don't even know what you're talking help, about. Baby. Talk is cheap. Shy, I'll see you on Thursday for the Contemporary That's History fine. of Iran, That's the fine. Golha Legacy. Mm. Thank you, everybody. Great job. We'll see you. Uh, and by the way, if you guys out there have any questions, which I'm sure you do, or comments about the this episode with the Iranians and the metaphors, info at rookmedia.com. 
info at rookmedia.com or post on any of our platforms because I think we should continue these discussions. Clearly, there's a, a lot of people who are interested in this stuff. That's full time for Rook for today. To uh, find all things Rook and to become a patron of this show where you can support us, rookmedia.com. I didn't do the patron call earlier in the show. Oh, well. Rookmedia.com. Support us. And uh, for five or ten bucks a month or more, your choice. You can help us keep this thing going. Uh, If you're a regular fan, we invite you to do that. Thanks to the amazing a team who put this show together. Savvy Rohan, talented Anahita, Ponce, the artist, the fabulous Keon, Super Patty, Saw, Ahoy, Merdad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not, not done so already on any or all of our platforms. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. And as ever, Mizu Bashi.